I got two short questions. One is how do you find intrinsic value in a company? Well, intrinsic value is what is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of a business is. In other words, the only reason for making an investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's, that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so it means the United States government bonds, it's very easy to tell them what you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments, it says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It can change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are, the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst, is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. When we buy you know, some new machine for Shaw to make carpet, that's what we're thinking about, obviously. And you, you all learn that in business school. But it's the same thing for a big business. It, it, if you buy Coca-Cola today, the company is selling for about 100 and 10 to 15 billion dollars in the market. The question is, if you had 110 or 15 billion, you wouldn't be listening to me, but uh, I'd be listening to you incidentally. Uh, but the question is, would you lay it out today to get what the Coca-Cola company is going to deliver to you over the next two or 300 years? The discount rate doesn't make much difference after, uh, as you get further out. But, and that is a question of how much cash they're going to give you. It isn't a question of, you know, it isn't a question about how many analysts are going to recommend it or what the volume in the stock is or what the chart looks like or anything. It's a question of how much cash it's going to give you. That's the only reason. It's the true if you're buying a farm. It's true if you're buying an apartment house. Any financial asset, oil in the ground, you're laying out cash now to get more cash back later on. And the question is, is how much are you going to get, when are you going to get it, and how sure are you? And when I calculate intrinsic value of a business, when we buy businesses, and whether we're buying all of a business or a little piece of a business, I always think we're buying the whole business because that's my approach to it. I look at it and say, what, what will come out of this business and when? And what you really like, of course, is them to be able to use the money they earn and earn higher returns on it as you go along. I mean, Berkshire has never distributed anything to its shareholders, but its ability to distribute goes up as the value of the businesses we own increases. We can compound it internally. But the real question is, Berkshire selling for, we'll say, 105 or so billion now. Uh, what can we distribute from that 100? If you're going to buy the whole company for 105 billion now, can we distribute enough cash to you soon enough to make it sensible at present interest rates to lay out that cash now? And that's, that's what it gets down to. And if, the, if you can't answer that question, you can't buy the stock. You know, you can, you can gamble in the stock if you want to, or your neighbors can buy it. But if you don't answer that question, and I, I can't answer that for, for internet companies, for example. There are a lot of companies, there are all kinds of companies I can't answer it for, but I just stay away from those. Number two. So you've got formulas involved in finding intrinsic values on certain companies. I mean, you, you've got a mathematical system it's set up. Just kind of present value of future cash, yeah. Okay. Second short question is, why haven't you uh, written down your set of formulas or your strategies in written form so you can share it with everyone else? Well, I think I actually have written about that. If, if you read the annual reports over the recent years, in fact, the most recent annual report, I, I, I use what I've just been talking about. I use the illustration of Aesop. Because here Aesop was in 600 BC. Smart man. Wasn't smart enough to know it was 600 BC, though. I mean, <laughs> would take a little foresight. Uh, uh, but Aesop you know, in between tortoises and hares and all these other things, he found time to write about, you know, birds. And he said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, that isn't quite complete. Because the question is, how sure are you that there are two in the bush? And how long do you have to wait to get them out? Now, he probably knew that, but he just didn't have time because he had all these other proverbs to write uh, and had to get on with it. So, but he was halfway there in 600 BC. That's all there is to investing, is how many birds are in the bush, when are you going to get them out, and how sure are you? Now, if interest rates are 15%, 
roughly, you've got to get two birds out of the bush in five years to equal the bird in the hand. But if interest rates are 3% and you can get two birds out in 20 years, it still makes sense to give up the bird in the hand because it all gets back to discounting against an interest, uh, an interest rate. The uh, problem is often you don't know, you know, not only how many birds are in the bush, but in the case of the internet companies, there weren't any birds in the bush. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but they still take the bird that you give them if in the hand. Uh, but it's, but I, I, I actually have written about this sort of thing and uh, stealing heavily from Aesop, who wrote it some 2,600 years ago, but I've been behind on my reading. Uh, the first has to do with intrinsic value. Can you provide some additional cliff notes for working with the Berkshire Hathaway annual report and cal calculating an intrinsic value for the stock? I'm, I'm a little bit hazy. The question on intrinsic value, you know, we, we've written about it in reports. I don't think there's much additional to say. I mean, the, the, the intrinsic value of any financial asset you know, is the stream of cash that it will produce between now and Judgment Day discounted by uh, an, an interest rate that equates between all the different possible assets. That's true of an oil royalty, a farm, an apartment house, an equity, a, a business operation, a, you know, a lemonade stand. And uh, that you have to decide what sort of businesses that you think you can understand well enough to make a some kind of reasonable calculation. It, it's not scientific, uh, but it is it, it 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 is the intrinsic value. I mean, the fact that it's it's fuzzy to calculate doesn't mean doesn't mean that it's not the proper way to think about it. And at Berkshire, you've got two questions. You've got the question of what the businesses we own now are worth, and then since we redeploy all the capital they generate, you have to figure out what you're willing to assume about what we do with the capital. And you can look back and say that 35 years ago or so that people perhaps underestimated what would be done with the capital that was generated so that it looks very cheap if you look back on it now. But we're in a whole different game now with huge amounts of capital and uh, you, have to, you have to make a decision as to whether the billions and billions and billions of dollars we generate will be deployed in a, in a way that creates lots more cash later on. And it's what Charlie and I think about, but we can't give any prediction on it. Charlie? Yeah, I think our reporting, considering the complexity of the enterprise as now constituted, is better than that of any similar enterprise I know in terms of enabling a shareholder to calculate intrinsic value. So I think we've done better than anybody else, and we do it conscientiously. And if you ask, will we improve from here? I don't think so. We've worked, we, we, we've worked hard at, at, at doing what you're talking about. And uh, it, but even working hard at it, I mean, we, we, we've given you the data we would want ourselves. We don't know the answer, uh, but we do know it's what you have to think about. And, and we do it when we, when we buy uh, McLean's, when we buy Clayton Homes, when we buy anything, we are attempting to look out into the economic future and say, what kind of cash can this business generate over time? How sure do we feel about it? And how does the purchase price compare with that? And if we feel we're getting a, if we, we have to feel fairly good about our projections. We won't feel perfect because we, no one knows the answer precisely. We have to feel pretty good about our projections and then we have to have a purchase price that's rational in relation to those. And we get some surprises in both directions. Actually, if you go way back, we've had more pleasant surprises than when we would have expected. But we won't get them from this point, because, mostly because of size and also because the world's a little more competitive. And uh, this is a question about intrinsic value. And it's a question for both of you, because you have written that perhaps you would come up with uh, different answers. You uh, write and speak a great deal about intrinsic value, um, and you indicate that you try to give shareholders the tools in the annual report so they can come to their own determination. What I'd like you to do is expand upon that a little bit. First of all, what, uh, 
what do you believe to be the important tools, either in the Berkshire Annual Report or other annual reports that you review uh, in determining intrinsic value? And secondly, what rules or principles or standards do you use in applying those tools? If we uh, could see in it looking at any business what its future cash inflows or outflows from the business to the owners or from the owners would be over the next, we'll call it a hundred years or until the business is extinct and then could discount that back at the appropriate interest rate, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, that would give us a number for intrinsic value. In other words, it would be like looking at a bond that had a whole bunch of coupons on it that was due in 100 years, and if you could see what those coupons are, you can figure the value of that bond compared to government bonds if you want to stick an appropriate risk rate in. Uh, or you can compare one government bond with 5% coupons to another government bond with 7% coupons. Each one of those bonds has a different value because they have different coupons printed on them. Businesses have coupons that are going to develop in the future, too. The only problem is they aren't printed on the instrument, and it's up to the investor to try to estimate what those coupons are going to be over time. As we have said in high-tech businesses or something like that, we don't have the faintest idea what the coupons are going to be. When we get into businesses where we think we can understand them reasonably well, we are trying to print the coupons out. We are trying to figure out what businesses are going to be worth in 10 or 20 years. When we bought C's Candy in 1972, we had to come to the judgment as to whether we could figure out the competitive forces that would operate the strengths and weaknesses of the company and, and how that would look over a 10 or 20 or 30 year period. And if you attempt to assess intrinsic value, it, it all relates to cash flows. The only reason for putting cash into any kind of an investment now is because you expect to take cash out, not by selling it to somebody else because that's just a game of who beats who, but by, in a sense, by what the asset itself produces. That's true if you're buying a farm, it's true if you're buying an apartment house, it's true if you're buying a business. Uh, Mr. Buffett, you've indicated that most of us in this room could acquire a lot of the information that you and Charlie acquire through the annual reports, yet you both also indicated that the uh, gap rules a lot of times leave a little to be desired. Could you perhaps uh, give an indication as to how you and Charlie come up with the economic value or the intrinsic value of the businesses that you uh, finally decide to invest in and, and a little bit about the process that you go through with that? Thank you. Uh, well, the, ec the you know, we, it, in, the, <clears throat> in the 1992 annual report, we discussed that a fair amount, but the economic value of any asset essentially is the is the present value, the appropriate interest rate, of all the future streams of cash going in or out of the business. And there are all kinds of businesses that Charlie and I don't think we have the faintest idea what that, that future stream will look like. And if we don't have the faintest idea what the future stream is going to look like, we don't have the faintest idea what it's worth now. now that, so if you think you know what the price of a stock should be today, but you don't think you have any idea what the stream of cash will be over the next 20 years, you've got uh, uh, cognitive dissonance, I guess is what they call it. Uh, the, uh, so we are looking for things where we feel fairly high degree of probability that we can come within a range of, of looking at those numbers out over a period of time, and then we discount them back, and we are more concerned with the certainty of those numbers than we are with getting the one that looks absolutely the cheapest, but based upon numbers that we don't have any, uh, don't have great confidence in. And that's, that's basically what economic value is all about. The numbers in any accounting report mean nothing per se as to economic value. They are guidelines to tell you something about how to get at economic value, but they don't tell you anything there are no answers in the financial statements. There are, there are guidelines to enable you to, 
figure out the answer. And to figure out that answer, you have to understand something about business. You don't have to understand a lot about mathematics. I mean, the math is, is, is not complicated. But you do have to understand something about the business. But that's the same thing you would do if you're going to buy an apartment house or a farm uh, or any other small business you might be interested in. You would try to figure out what you are laying out currently and what you are likely to get back over time and how certain you felt about getting it and how it compared to other alternatives. That's all we do. We just do it with, with large businesses, basically. The, account, the, the, the accounting figures are very helpful to us in the sense that they, they generally guide us to, to what we should be thinking about. And, 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 uh, and of course, if we find numbers where it looks like people are, are taking the most optimistic interpretation of things that they can under GAAP and all of that, we get very worried about people who, who look like they uh, massage the numbers in any way. And there are plenty of people that do. I would like to get some more transparency on how you make investment decisions, particularly how you determine intrinsic values. You mentioned that the theoretically correct method is discounted cash flow, but at the same time you point out the inherent difficulties of the methodology. From other books, I see that you use multiples on operating earnings or owner multiples. Your daughter Mary, in one of her books, describes another methodology where you apply compounding economics to the value of the equity. Could you give us a bit more transparency which quantitative approach you use and how many years out you try to quantify the results of the investments you're interested in? I understand the question, but I'm going to pretend I don't let Charlie answer first. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, understand. when you're trying to determine something like intrinsic value and margin of safety and so on, there is no one easy method that could be simply mechanically applied by, say, a computer and make anybody who could punch the buttons rich. By definition, this is going to be a game which you play with multiple techniques and multiple models, and a lot of experience is very helpful. I don't think you can become a great investor very rapidly any more than you could become a great bone tumor pathologist very rapidly. It takes some experience, and that's why it's helpful to get a very early start. Um, but if you're, if you, let's just say that we, we all decided we're going to buy a, or think about buying a farm, and we go up 30 miles north of here, and we find out that a farm up there can produce 120 bushels of corn, and it can produce 45 bushels of soybean per acre, and we know what fertilizer costs, and we know what the property taxes cost, and we know what we'll have to pay the farmer to actually do the work involved, and we'll get some number that we can make per acre using fairly conservative assumptions. And if you, let's just assume that when you get through making those calculations, it turns out to be that you can make $70 an acre to the owner without working at it. Then the question is, how much do you pay for the $70? Do you assume that agriculture will get a little bit better over the years so that your yields will be a little higher? Do you assume that prices will work a little higher over time? They haven't done much of that, although recently it's been good with corn and soybeans. But over the years, agriculture prices have not done too much. So you, you would be conservative in your assumptions. And you might decide that for $70 an acre, you know, you would want to, if you decided you wanted a 7% return, you'd pay $1,000 an acre. Now, if farmland is selling for 900 you know, you're going to have a buy signal, and if it's selling for 1200 you're going to look at something else. That's what we do in businesses. We are trying to figure out what those corporate form, farms that we're looking at are going to produce, and to do that, we have to understand their competitive position. We have to understand the, the dynamics of the business. We have to, you know, we have to be able to look out in the future, and like I've said earlier, some businesses you can't look out very far at. But the, the mathematics of investment were set out by Aesop, 600 BC. And he said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, our question is, when do we get the two? You know, how long do we wait? How sure are we that there are two in the bush? Could there be more? You know, what's the right discount rate? 
and we measure one against the other that way. I mean, we are looking at a whole bunch of businesses. How many birds are they going to give us? When are they going to give them to us? And we try to decide which ones, you know, basically which, which, uh, which bushes we want to buy out in the future. It's all about, and, and it's all about evaluating future, future ability to distribute cash or to reinvest cash at high rates if it isn't distributed. Berkshire's never distributed any cash, but it's growing in its cash producing abilities, and we retain it because we think we can create more than a dollar present value by retaining it. But it's the ability to distribute cash that gives Berkshire its value. And we try to increase that ability to distribute cash year by year by year, and then we try to keep it and invest it in a way so that a dollar bill is worth more than a dollar. Uh, you may have an insight into very few businesses. I mean, if we left here and walked by a McDonald's stand, you know, and you decided, would you pay a million dollars for that McDonald's stand or a million three or 900,000, you'd think about how likely it was there would be more competition, how, whether McDonald's could change the franchise arrangement on you, whether people are going to keep eating hamburgers, you know, all kinds of things. And you actually would say to yourself, this McDonald's stand will make X, X plus 5%, maybe in a couple of years, because over time, uh, prices will increase a little, and that's that's all investing is. But the, you have to know when you know what you're doing, and you have to know when you're getting outside of what I call your circle of competence, and you don't have the faintest idea. Charlie, yeah, yeah the, the other thing you got to recognize that we've never had any system for being able to make correct judgments on the values of all businesses. We throw almost all decisions into the too hard pile and we just sift for the, a few decisions we can make that are easy and uh, that's a comparative process and and if, if you're if you're looking for an ability to correctly value all investments at all times uh, we can't help you we know how to step over one foot bars. We don't know how to jump over seven foot bars. But we do know how to recognize occasionally what is a one foot bar. Yeah. And, and we know enough to stay away from the seven foot bars, too. Uh, I want to ask a question about the valuation of your company. You said price is what you pay and value is what you get. In your letter to the shareholders this year, each Class A share owns about in investment about $95,000, and each share commands an earning of $6,000. So in my simplistic way of calculation, each share is worth $95,000 of investment plus the earnings discounted at 7%. That's another about $90,000. So it adds up to about $185,000. Is that correct? Does that mean the complexity of your empire is a value trap? We, uh, we give those figures because we think they're important, both the uh, investments per share and the operating earnings per share, excluding the earnings that come from the investments, and, uh, and leaving out insurance underwriting profits or losses because we think at worst they'll break even, but they do bounce around from year to year. Uh, those figures are pre-tax on the operating earnings, uh, so I'm not sure whether you're applying your discount factor to pre-tax or after-tax, but we think they're important. And I would expect, that, well, the operating earnings, you know, are almost certain uh, to increase. Uh, how much, you know, who knows, but that number is likely to go up. The investments are still about the same uh, as at year end, but that they could go up or down based on whether we're able to buy more operating businesses. Uh, our goal is our goal is to build both numbers to some extent, but our our primary goal is to build the operating earnings figures. We never we. If Charlie and I had to stick a number in an envelope right now in front of us as to what we thought the intrinsic value of Berkshire was, well, neither one of us would stick a figure. We'd stick a range because it, it, it would be uh, ridiculous to uh, come up with a, 
a single specific number, which encompasses not only the businesses we own, but what we're going to do with the capital in the future. But even our ranges uh, would differ modestly. At, uh, and they might, might differ tomorrow in terms of how I would feel versus today, but not, not dramatically at all. Ben Graham and the uh, model of value investing, I'd like to bring discussion back to that. And what's interesting and exceptional about you and Charlie and Ben Graham is the self-discipline, the incredible self-discipline. And if you look at the model and try to think how to present it to teach others that self-discipline, I think you have to make a little tweak to it in two areas. And that's what I'd like you to comment on. One, intrinsic value. It's always discussed that you calculate intrinsic value. But in practice, I think you find a number that is guaranteed 99% likely to be less than intrinsic value. Classic example was in 2000 when you said you'd buy shares back at 45,000. You weren't saying that Berkshire Hathaway's intrinsic value was 45,000. You were saying it was significantly more. And anyone who bought it for less than 40, 45,000 is grateful to you. The other area is the hidden assumption in the model. And that is, it's assumed that once you find a value stock and you buy it, that the intrinsic value isn't going to go down. And that's a second part of the analysis that has to be part of the discipline. So even though you found a value stock, you still haven't done all the work. You have to analyze, is the intrinsic value going to go down? In particular, companies throw away intrinsic value is the most common. Management gives it away. Uh, that hasn't happened at Berkshire and Hathaway, although I don't want to give an unqualified comment on that since I see you're remodeling the offices. So we don't know how much intrinsic value has been thrown away there. So if you comment on the two things, do you calculate intrinsic value or a number that's absolutely positively under intrinsic value, that's the number you put in the equation. And even when you find a stock selling for less than the, this lower bound of intrinsic value, do you still do the homework on the second part and analyze, will the intrinsic value go down in the future? Thank you. Yeah, I would feel somewhat better qualified to speak on self-discipline if I weighed about 20 pounds less. But for the moment, we'll ignore that. The, uh, the, the second part of your question relating to intrinsic value going down, actually, if you compute intrinsic value as reflecting the discounted value of future cash flows, that should have built into it a calculation that allows for the fact that certain businesses are going to earn less in the future than now. It isn't that their intrinsic value goes down then, because you should build it into your, into your calculation uh, right now. But, you know, as we point out many times in the past, in, intrinsic value is terribly important and, 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 and very fuzzy. And we do our best to work with, in the kind of businesses where we think that we have the highest probabilities, where our, where our predictions are, are of a, high, a fairly highly probable nature. And there's, that leaves out all kinds of companies. Uh, it's pretty good, we'll say, it's something like a natural gas pipeline. I mean, it, it, the chances of big surprises will, in, a, in a pipeline should be relatively uh, small. That doesn't mean they're, they're, they're zero, but they're relatively small. Now, let's assume that you had a gas, a gas pipeline, which some have, where either the supply of gas is going to run down or where there are competitive pipelines that may be trying to take away your contracts that you wrote 10 years ago and expire in two years and you're going to have to cut prices. I would say that two years from now when you have to cut prices, the intrinsic value hasn't gone down from today if you properly calculate it today and build in the fact that profit margins in the future will be lower than today. We looked at a pipeline recently where we think they are going to be vulnerable to competitive price pressures because of alternate ways of getting gas to market uh, through other pipelines. And the calculation is entirely different. Uh, the calculation is different. The results are different uh, in terms of that pipeline versus the pipeline that is the low bring gas from a, one market to another uh, and will remain the low cost producer. But it isn't if, if properly calculated, you build in the, the uh, prediction of decline in future operating earnings. You don't wait till you get there uh, to anticipate it. Um, 
You know, Charlie's famous for saying that all he wants to know is where he's going to die so he'll never go there. Well, <laughs> that's part of predicting in business. I mean, there, I love the, I'm, I really have never seen an investment banker's book. I, I, I hope to see one someday, and I hope I can survive the shock when I do see it, where the earnings of the business being offered go down. Lots of businesses' earnings go down, and, and they're going to go down. And I get all this nonsense, you know, where they project it out for 10 years, and it always goes up. It just isn't the real world. And you have to analyze businesses. Some businesses are going to be subjected to enormous competitive pressures that aren't extant today. And we made that mistake, for example, at Dexter Shoe. I mean, we bought a business that was earning $40 million or so pre-tax. And we assumed that the future would be as good as the past. And we, we couldn't have been more, I, I couldn't have been more wrong. So that was a case of projecting into the future conditions which were not going to exist in the future, competitive conditions. That's part of, you know, that's part of business. And I will tell you that, you know, 20% of the Fortune 500, but I don't know which 20% are going to be earning, you know, significantly less money probably five years from now than they are today. And that's, that's what the game is all about, figuring out what those future cash flows are likely to be. And when you can't, when you feel you can't come up with reasonable estimates in that respect, you move on to the next one. BYD appears to be more like a venture capital speculative investment than a value investment. Would you both explain that investment, your logic behind it, and your expectations for it? Yeah. I'm going to turn that over to Charlie in just one second, but Charlie and I think there is no other kind of investment than a value investment. In other words, we, we don't know how anybody would invest in a non-value investment. And, and so we, we've always been puzzled by the term value and saying that contrasts with growth or anything. Value relates to getting a lot for the, the expectable flow of cash in the future in terms of what you're laying out today. So we, we, we've always, every, every time somebody characterizes us as value investors, we, we always ask them what other kind can there be. Uh, you earlier today discussed intrinsic value, and I'm a big fan of Graham and Fisher, especially security analysis. What differences do you have, if any, for calculating intrinsic value versus what was said in security analysis? And for example, how does management factor into that? You recently mentioned evaluating management is like dating. And recently, you said also, management does matter. My second part is, which company do you fear the most? Why is it that no one else has done what you have done? I mean, Coca-Cola has their Pepsi. Thank you. Yeah, the, actually, Graham didn't get too specific about intrinsic value in terms of precise calculations. But intrinsic value has come to be equated with, and I think quite properly, with what you might call private business value. Now, I'm not sure who was the first one that came up with it, but, well, the first one that came up with it was ESOP, actually. But uh, the intrinsic value of any, any business, if you could foresee the future perfectly, is the pr present value of all cash that will be ever distributed for that business between now and Judgment Day. And we're not perfect at estimating that, obviously. Uh, but that, that is, that's what an investment or a business is all about. You put money in and you take money out. Aesop said a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, he said that around 600 BC or something like that. But that hasn't been improved on very much by by the business professors now. Uh, now the question is, is, you know, how sure are you that there are two in the bush? You know, how far away is the bush? There are all kinds of things. What are interest rates? But, I mean, Aesop wanted to leave us something to play with over the next couple thousand years, so he didn't spell the whole thing out. But that's, that's what intrinsic, intrinsic value essentially is. It's, and, and, uh, we don't, Graham would say that, Phil Fisher would say that, Phil Fisher would say that 
in calculating that, he would want to look a lot harder at the qualitative factors of the business in making that estimate of how many birds were in the bush. Uh, Graham would say he would want to see the bush, you know, two dollars worth of cash in the bush, you know, and to pay a dollar for it now. And uh, it, one emphasized quantitative factors and one emphasized qualitative factors, but neither one would have disagreed with the math. And I started out very influenced by Graham, so I emphasized quantitative factors. Charlie came along and said I was all wrong and that he'd learned more in law than I'd learned in financial studies and everything, and that I should think more about qualitative factors, and he was right. And Phil Fisher said the same thing. Uh, but that's, that's what intrinsic value is about. You know, if, if you buy a McDonald's franchise, if you, if you buy General Motors, whatever it may be, the real question is, A, are you gonna to have to put more cash into it after you buy it? But it's really cash in, cash out, when, what discount rate, all the standard stuff. But, uh, so my question is, free cash flow, sell side analysts, like to do a 10-year discounted cash flow analysis with the terminal value. Even some of the books written about your style, uh, the Warren Buffett way, Buffettology, imply that you go through that exercise. But I know you're famous for not using computers or calculators. I'm wondering if those type of exercises fall into the too hard uh, file and you, and you just do a simple free cash flow, normalized free cash flow over a discount rate. And if you care to augment the answer with your numerical analysis of Coke, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> well, the answer is that investing, all investing is is laying out cash now to get more cash back at a later date. Now, the question is, how much do you get back? How sure are you of getting it? When do you get it? It goes back to Aesop's fables, you know. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now that was said by Aesop in 600 BC now. And he was a very smart man. He didn't know it was 600 BC, but I mean, he couldn't know everything. The, uh, <laughs> but that, that's what's being taught in, in the finance. You, you get a PhD now and, and, and you, you do it more complicated and you don't say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush because you, you can't really impress the laity with that sort of thing. But the real question is how many birds are in the bush? You know you're laying out a bird today, the dollar. And then how many birds are in the bush? How sure are you in the bush? How many birds are in other bushes? What's the discount rate? In other words, if, it, if, if interest rates are 20%, you gotta get those two birds faster than if interest rates are 5% and so on. Uh, that's what we do. I mean, we are looking at putting out cash now to get back more cash later on. Uh, you mentioned that I don't use a computer or calculator. If you need to use a computer or calculator to make the calculation, uh, you shouldn't buy it. I mean, it should be so obvious that you don't have to carry it out to tenths of a percent or hundredths of a percent. It should scream at you. So you, if, if, if you really need a calculator to figure out that it's, the discount rate is 9.6% instead of 9.8%, forget about the whole exercise. Just go on to something that shouts at you. and and. Uh, Essentially, we look at every business that way, but we, it, you're right, we do not make, we do not sit down with spreadsheets and do all that sort of thing. We just, we just see something that obviously is better than anything else around that we understand, and, uh, and then we act. And uh, Charlie, you wanna to add to that? Well, I'd go further. I'd say some of the worst business decisions I've ever seen are those that have done with a lot of formal projections and discounts back. Uh, Shell Oil Company did that when they bought the Bell Ridge Oil Company and they had all these engineers make all these elaborate figures and the trouble with that is you get to believe the figures and, uh, and it, it, it seems that the higher mathematics with more false precision should help you but it, it doesn't. It, 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 the effects averaged out are negative when you try and uh, formalize it to the degree you're talking about it. They do that in business schools because, well, they've got to do something. There's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you stand up in front of a class and you say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, you know, you're not going to get tenure. <laughs> so it's very important 
if you're in the priesthood, to look at least like you know a whole lot more than the people you're preaching to. And if you, if you come down and just, if, if you're a priest and you just hand down the Ten Commandments and you say, this is it, and we'll all go home, you know, you, you, it, it just isn't the way to progress in the world. So uh, the false precision that goes into saying this is a two standard deviation event or this is a three standard deviation event and therefore we can afford to take this much risk and all that, it's totally crazy. I mean, you saw it with long-term capital management in 1998. You've seen it time and time and time again. And it only happens to people with high IQs. You know, those of you who are, have 120 IQs are all safe. <laughs> but if you have a very high IQ and you've learned all this stuff, you know, you feel you have to use it. And, and uh, the markets are not that way. The markets of mid-September last year, when people who ran huge institutions were wondering how they were going to get funding the next week, you know, that doesn't appear on a... You can't calculate the standard deviation that, that that arises at. It's going to arise much more often than people think in markets that are made by people that get scared and get greedy. Uh, and they don't observe the laws of flipping coins it, uh, in terms of the distribution of results. And it's, it's a terrible mistake to think that mathematics uh, will take you a long place in investing. You have to understand certain aspects of mathematics, but you don't have to understand higher mathematics and higher mathematics may actually be dangerous and it will lead you down to in, down pathways that are better left untrod. Okay. Charlie, you've mentioned that if given the chance or the same chance with a smaller capital base, you would still look for mispriced stock opportunities. Of uh, course. <laughs> uh, and that would be determined through obviously what, what we call the, uh, the intrinsic value of the organization or the, the company in question an aggregate of the discounted future cash flows. Would you work the arithmetic using a fictional data set to illustrate the mathematical principia uh, to determine an intrinsic value? Um, and I'd hope you include the comprehensive metal, uh, mental model of the key metrics considered, any quali uh, qualitative assessments of the management, and any assumptions of its industry to determine the durability of its earning power. Uh, and Warren, uh, same, same to that effect, would you also demonstrate or illustrate a uh, an arithmetic uh, problem set using with a significant capital base and provide the object lessons on how those have changed from a small to a large capital base? Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. And I just mix all, I just mix all the factors and, and if the gap between value and, and prices not attractive, I'd go on to something else. And sometimes it's just quantitative. For instance, when Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate, I like the competitive position, I liked the, the way the personnel system worked. I, I liked everything about it and I thought, even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll, they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. This is the longest we've ever gone in the Berkshire meeting without Charlie saying that, getting to the point where he prefers Costco to Berkshire. <laughs> well, I will say this, that the concept of intrinsic value used to be a lot easier because there were all kinds of stocks that were selling for 50% or less of the amount at which you could have easily liquidated the whole corporation if you owned the whole corporation. Indeed, in the history of Berkshire Hathaway, we bought things at 20% of, of then liquidating value. And in the old days, the Ben Graham followers could run their Geiger counters over corporate America, and they could spill out a few things. And you could easily sit, see, if you were at all familiar with the market prices of, of whole corporations, that you were buying at a huge discount. Well, 
no matter how bad the management, if you're buying at 50 percent of asset value or 30 percent or so on down, you have a lot going for you. And, uh, and as the world has wised up and as stocks have behaved so well for people, that stocks generally have gone to higher and higher prices, that game gets much harder. Now to find something at a discount from intrinsic value, those simple systems ordinarily don't work. You've got to get into Warren's kind of thinking, and that is a lot harder. I think you can predict the future in a few places best if you understand a few basic ideas that come from a good general education. And, uh, and that's what I was talking about in that talk I gave at the USC Business School. In other words, Coca-Cola is a simple company if it's stripped down and analyzed in terms of some elemental forces. Well, Charlie it's hard Thompson. to understand Costco either. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, there are certain fundamental models out there that do not take. You don't have the kind of ability that quantum mechanics requires. You just have to know a few simple things and really know them. When Charlie talks about liquidating. Now, you're not talking about closing up the enterprise, but he's talking about what somebody else would pay for that stream of cash, too. I mean, yeah. it, 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 you could have looked at a collection of television stations uh, owned by a, a Cap Cities, for example, in the, in the early to, well, 1974, and it would have been worth, we'll say, four times what the company was selling for. Uh, not because you'd close the stations, but just their, their stream of income was worth that to somebody else. It's just that the marketplace was... Uh, very depressed, depressed. Although, like I say, on a negotiated basis, you could have gone and sold the properties for four times what the the company was selling for, and you got wonderful management. And I mean, those things happen in markets; they will happen again. At, uh, uh, but part of part of investing and calculating intrinsic values is if you get the wrong answer when you get through. In other words, if it says don't buy, you can't buy just because somebody else thinks it's going to go up, or because your friends have made a lot of easy money lately, or anything of the sort. You just you have to be able to. Uh, to walk away from anything that doesn't work, and and very few things work these days. You also have to work, walk away from anything you don't understand, which in my case is a big handicap. But you would agree, wouldn't you, Warren, that it's much harder now? Yeah, but I would also agree that almost at any time over the last 40 years that we've been up on a podium, we would have said it was much harder in the past, too. <laughs> but it, it is harder now. It's way harder. It, but part, of, part of it being harder now, too, is, is the amount of capital we run. I mean, if if we were running $100,000, our prospects for returns would be, and, and, and we really needed the money, our prospects for return would be considerably better than they are uh, running Berkshire. It's just, it's, it's very simple. Our universe of possible ideas would expand by a huge factor. We are looking at things today that, by their nature, a lot of people have to, are looking at. And, and there were times in the past when we were looking at things that very few people were looking at. But there were other times in the past when we were looking at things where the whole world was just looking at them kind of crazy. And, and, and that, that's a decided help. At what rate has Berkshire compo compounded intrinsic value over the last 10 years? And at what rate including your explanation for it, please. Do you think intrinsic value can be com compounded over the next 10 years? Yeah. Intrinsic value, you know, can only be calculated or gains, you know, in retrospect. But, but the intrinsic value, pure definition, would be the, the cash to be generated between now and Judgment Day uh, discounted at a, an interest rate that seems appropriate uh, at the time, and that's, that's varied enormously over a 30- or 40-year period. And if you pick out 10 years uh, and you're back to uh, May of 2007, you know, we had some unpleasant things coming up, but we, I would say that we've probably compounded at about 10 percent, and I think that's going to be tough to achieve 
fact, almost impossible to achieve if we continued in this interest rate environment. That's the number one question. If you ask me to give the answer to the question, if, if I could only pick one statistic to ask you about the future uh, before I gave the answer, uh, I, would not I would not ask you about GDP growth. I would not ask you about who was going to be president. I would, a million things. I would, I would ask you what the interest rate is going to be over the next 20 years on average, the 10 year or whatever you wanted to do. And if, if you assume our present interest rate structure is likely to be the average over 10 or 20 years, then I would say it'd be very difficult to get to 10%. On the other hand, if I were to pick with a whole range of probabilities on interest rates, I would say that that rate might be, it, it might be somewhat aspirational and it might, well, it might be doable. Uh, and it, you would say, well, we can't continue these interest rates for a long time. I, I would ask you to look at Japan, you know, where 25 years ago, we couldn't see how their interest rates could be sustained. And we're still looking at the same thing. So I do not think it's easy to predict the course of interest rates at all. And unfortunately, predicting that is embedded in giving a good answer to you. I would say the chances of getting a terrible result in Berkshire are probably as low as about anything you can find. Chances of getting a sensational result are also about as low as anything you can find. Uh, so if I, I would, I, my best guess would be uh, in the 10% range, but that, that assumes some what higher interest rates, not dramatically higher, but somewhat higher interest rates in the, in the next 10 or 20 years than we've experienced in the last seven years. Charlie? Well, there's no question about the fact that the future with our present size is in terms of percentage rates of return is, is gonna be less glorious than our past. And we keep saying that and now we're proving it. Do you want to end on that note, Charlie, or would you care to? <laughs> well, I do think Warren's is right about one thing. I think we have a collection of businesses that on average has better investment values than say the S&P average. So I don't think you shareholders have a terrible, terrible problem. And I, I would say we probably, well, I'm certain on my way, we have a we we do have more of a shareholder orientation than the S and P 500 as as a whole. I mean, for, uh, you know, the uh, this company has a culture where decisions are made uh, for uh, as as an owner, as a private owner, would make them. And, and frankly, that's a luxury we have that many companies don't have. I mean, they're under pressures today sometimes to do things. One of the, one of the questions I ask the CEO of every public company that I meet is, what would you be doing differently if you owned it all yourself? And the answer, you know, is usually this, that, and a couple of other things. If you would ask us, the answer is, is you know, we're doing exactly what we would do if we owned them all, all the stock ourselves. Uh, and I think that's a, a small plus over time. Anything further, Charlie? I think we have one other advantage. A lot of other people are trying to be brilliant, and we're just trying to stay rational. And, and it's, an, it's a big advantage. Mm -hmm. Trying to be brilliant is dangerous, particularly yeah. when you're gambling. I'm interested in, in that many of the holdings of Berkshire are in industries that are perceived as interest rate sensitive industries, including Wells Fargo, Solomon, Freddie Mac, even Geico. And yet, you, you have an admitted sort of ambivalence towards interest rates or changes in interest rates. And it therefore seems that you don't feel that those changes affect the fundamental attractiveness of those businesses. I thought maybe you could share your thoughts on what you see in these businesses that the, the investment community as a whole is ignoring? Well, the value of every business 
the value of a farm, the value of an apartment house, the value of any economic asset is 100% sensitive to interest rates because all you are doing in investing is transferring some money to somebody now in exchange for what you expect a stream of money to be to come in over a period of time. And the higher interest rates are, the less that present value is going to be. So every business by its nature, whether it's Coca-Cola or Gillette or Wells Fargo, is in its intrinsic valuation is, is, is uh, 100 percent sensitive to interest rates. Now the question as to whether a Wells Fargo or a Freddie Mac or whatever it may be, whether their business gets better or worse uh, internally as opposed to the valuation process because of higher interest rates, that, 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 that is not easy to figure. I mean, Geico, if they write their insurance business at the same, at the same underwriting ratio, in other words, they have the same loss and expense experience relative to the premiums, they benefit by higher interest rates, obviously, over time because they're a float business and the float is worth more uh, to them. Now, externally, getting back to the valuation part, the present value of those earnings also becomes less then, but the present value of Coke's earnings becomes less uh, in, in a higher interest rate environment. Wells Fargo, it's uh, whether they earn more or less money under any given interest rate scenario is hard to figure. There, there may be one short-term effect and there may be another long-term effect. So I do not have to have a view on interest rates and I don't have a view on interest rates, to make a decision as to an insurance business or a mortgage guarantor business uh, or a banking business or something of the sort uh, relative to making a judgment about Coke or Gillette. Charlie? Uh, I've got nothing to add. And lastly, um, I'm interested in how you pick your discount rate. I'm actually a, an alma mater of yours from business school, and I learned a bunch of junk about beta too. But I read that you just assigned the treasury rate, and I'm not sure if that's right, but I'd love you to, to, to talk about your discount rate, and I'd really appreciate as much detail about your thinking as you can give us. Yeah. Thanks. We do, we think in terms of the treasury, but as I said earlier, that doesn't mean we think once we've discounted something at the treasury rate that that's the right price to pay. We use the treasury rate just to get comparability across time and across companies. Um, but a dollar earned from a horseshoe company is the same as a dollar earned from an internet company in terms of the dollar. So it is not worth more based on the, whether somebody's, it comes from somebody named dot com, you know, or, or somebody that named, you know, the old fashioned horseshoe company. Uh, so the dollars are equal and, and our discount rates may reflect different experience, different expectations about future streams of income. but but they don't reflect any difference in, in terms of whether it comes from something that the market is all enthused about or, or, or otherwise. Um, you've given many clues to investors to help them calculate Berkshire's intrinsic value. I've attempted to calculate the intrinsic value of Berkshire using the discount of present value of its total look-through earnings. I've taken Berkshire's total look-through earnings and adjusted them for normalized earnings at GEICO the supercat business, and General Re. Then I've assumed that Berkshire's total look-through earnings will grow at 15% per annum on average for 10 years, 10 years per annum for years 11 through 20, and that earnings stop growing after year 20, resulting in a coupon equaling year 20 earnings from the 21st year onward. Lastly, I've discounted those estimated earnings stream at 10% to get an estimate of Berkshire's intrinsic value. My question is, is this a sound method? Is there a risk-free interest rate, such as a 30-year treasury, which might be the more appropriate rate to use here, given the predict predictable nature of your consolidated income stream? Thank you. Well, that, that is a very good question, and because that, that is the sort of way we think in terms of looking at other businesses. Uh, uh, Investment is the process of putting out money today to get more money back at some point in the future. And the question is, how far in the future, how much money, and, and what is the appropriate discount rate to take it back to the present day and determine how much you pay? And I would say you've stated the approach. Uh, uh, I, couldn't have, I couldn't state it better myself. Uh, the exact figures you want to use, whether you want to use 15% gains in earnings or 10% gains in the second decade, 
I would, I, you know, I have no comment on, 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 on those particular numbers, but you, were, you, ha you have the right approach. We would probably, in terms, we would probably use a lower discount factor in, in, in uh, evaluating any business now under present day interest rates. Now that doesn't mean we would pay that figure once we use that discount number, but we would use that to establish comparability across investment alternatives. So if we were looking at 50 companies and making the sort of calculation that you just talked about, we would use a, we, we might, we would probably use the long-term government rate to discount it back, but we wouldn't pay that number after we discounted it back. We would look for appropriate discounts from that figure, but it doesn't really make any difference whether you use a higher figure and, and then look across them or use, the, use our figure and look for the biggest discount. You've got the right approach, and then all you have to do is stick in the right numbers. And um, it, it kind of goes back to an article you wrote for Fortune magazine back in the late 70s um, about the effect of inflation on, on uh, equity values and, and that sort of thing. And in it, you asserted that uh, stocks were and businesses were really like bonds. Um, they just had their own par, and the par being the average 12% return on equity that companies have averaged. Um, you know, a company that does better than that has assets that are worth way more than 100 cents on a dollar. A company does less, you know, will be less correspondingly. Um, my question is, when you're projecting cash flows of a company uh, as a prospective investment, why would you use the uh, going insur or interest rate, um, you know, of, of, of risk-free uh, treasury bills? Why wouldn't you use the sort of opportunity cost to discount it that maybe Charlie was referring to, maybe 12% return on equity of average corporations, maybe you know your 15% goal, maybe Coca-Cola's return on equity is a comparison. I mean, doing that would dramatically change the value of the company that you're that you're you know evaluating, as I'm sure you know. Why would you use the risk-free rate? Is my question. The risk-free rate is used merely to equate one item to another. In other words, we're looking for whatever is the most attractive, but. In, in terms of present valuing anything, we've got to, we, we're going to use a number, and, and obviously, we can always buy the government bond, so that that becomes the yardstick rate. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds if the best thing we can find is only has a present value that uh, works out at a half percent a year better than the government bond. But it, it's the appropriate yardstick, in our view, to simply use to compare across all kinds of investment opportunities, oil wells, farms, whatever it may be. Uh, now, it gets into degree of certainty, too, but, the, but it, it is, it, it's the yardstick rate. It's not, it's not because we want to buy government, government bonds, but it does, it does serve to make that a constant throughout the valuation process. And I'm an MBA student at Wharton, but please don't hold that against me. We, we won't. <laughs> I never made it that far. I was an undergraduate student. <laughs> Could you please explain how you differentiate between types of businesses in your cash flow valuation process, given that you use the same discount rate across companies? For example, in valuing Coke and Geico, how do you account for the difference in the riskiness of their cash flows? We, we don't worry about risk in the traditional, uh, the way you're taught actually at Wharton. Uh, we, <laughs> but I, 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 it's, it's a good question, I, 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 believe me. Uh, but what we're, if we could see the future of every business perfectly, it wouldn't make any difference whether the money came from running streetcars or from selling software because all the cash that came out, which is all we're measuring between now and Judgment Day, would spend the same to us. It really, it, the industry that it's earned in means nothing except to the extent that it may tell you something about the ability to develop the cash, but it doesn't tell you, it has no meaning on the quality of the cash uh, once it becomes distributable. Uh, we look at riskiness essentially as being sort of a no, a go, no go valve in terms of looking at the future businesses. In other words, if we, if we think we simply don't know what's going to happen in the future, that doesn't mean it's necessarily risky, it just means we don't know. It, may, it means it's risky for us, it might not be risky for someone else who understands the business. Uh, in that case, 
we just give up. We don't try to predict those things. And we, we don't say, well, we don't know what's going to happen, so we'll, therefore we'll discount it at 9% instead of 7%, some number that we don't even know. Uh, that is not our way to approach it. We feel that once it passed the threshold test of being something about which we feel quite certain that the same discount factor tends to apply to, uh, to, to everything. And we try to do only things about which we're quite certain when we buy into uh, the businesses. So uh, we think all the capital asset pricing model type reasoning with different rates of, uh, of risk-adjusted return and all that, we, we tend to think it is, well, we don't tend to, we think it is nonsense. And uh, 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 But we do think it's also nonsense to get into situations or to try and evaluate situations where we don't uh, have any conviction to speak of as to what the future is going to look like. And we don't think you can, can compensate for that by having a higher discount rate and saying it's riskier so that I don't really know what's going to happen I'll have a higher discount rate. That, that just is not our way of approaching things. Um, in determining a company's intrinsic value, you seem to write or indicate that you project out a company's owner earnings for a number of years and then discount that back by prevailing rates. My question is, how much of a premium, if any, to prevailing risk-free rates do you demand when you discount back the own earnings of a company, or stated differently, for example, today with long rates at about 7%, if you did the same exercise with Coca-Cola, at what rate of interest would you discount back their own earnings? Yeah, we, we get asked that question a lot, and we've answered it to some extent in past annual reports about what discount rate to use. We basically think in terms of the long-term uh, government rate, and uh, uh, there may be times uh, when in a very, we don't, cause we, don't, we don't think we're any good at predicting interest rates, but probably in times of very, what would seem like very low rates, we might use a little higher rate. But we don't put the risk factor in per se because essentially the purity of the idea is that you're discounting future cash and it doesn't make any difference whether cash comes from a risky business or a safe business, so-called safe business. So the, 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 the value of the cash delivered by a water company, uh, which is going to be around for 100 years, uh, is not different than the value of the cash derived from some high-tech company, if, if any, um, that uh, you might be looking at. Uh, it may be harder for you to make the estimate, uh, and you, you may therefore want a bigger discount when you get all through with the calculation, but up to the point where you decide what you're willing to pay. You may decide you can't estimate it at all. I mean, that's what happens with us with most companies. But we believe in using uh, the, a, a, a government bond type interest rate. We believe in trying to stick with businesses that where we think we can see the future reasonably well. You never see it perfectly, obviously, but where we think we have a reasonable handle on it. And we would differentiate to some extent. We don't want to go below a certain threshold of understanding. So we want to stick with businesses we think we understand quite well and not try to have the whole panoply with all different kinds of risk rates because, frankly, we think that'd just be playing games with numbers. I mean, we, I don't think you can stick something, numbers, on a, on a highly speculative business where the whole industry is going to change in five years. And, and have them mean anything when you get through. If you say, I'm going to stick an extra 6% in on, on the interest rate to allow for the fact, I, I tend to think that's kind of nonsense. I mean, it may look mathematical, but, it's, but it's, it's, it's mathematical gibberish in my view. You better just stick with businesses that you can understand. Use the government bond rate, and when you can buy them something you understand well at a significant discount, then you should start getting excited. Charlie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, discounts were once greater than we now see. That's all you're going to get, folks. <laughs> <laughs> My question involves interest rates. Uh, when you calculate the intrinsic value of a business in a period of low interest rates like we have currently, do you use a higher discount rate to factor in higher rates in the future? And also, um, when, do you ever look at a company's free cash flow yield relative to current rates? The question on discount rates, we, um, we use the same discount, I mean, in theory, we would use the same discount rate across all securities because if you really knew the cash they were going to produce, you know, that would, that would take care of it. We may be more conservative 
in estimating the returns of cash from some, but the, the, the discount rate we would use is a constant. Now, in terms of where we commit, you know, we don't want to use the fact that short-term rates are one and a quarter percent to think that something that yields is three percent or four percent is a good deal. So we sort of have a minimum threshold in our mind about which we're below which we're unwilling to commit money. And we're unwilling to commit it whether interest rates are six or seven percent or whether they're three or four percent or whether they're on a short-term basis one percent. We just we don't want to get hooked into long-term investments at low rates just because they're a little bit better than than short rates would be or, or low government rates would be. So we, we, we have minimum thresholds in our mind. I can't tell you precisely what they are, but they're, uh, they're a whole lot higher than present government rates would be. And at other times, we'd be very happy owning governments just because we feel that they offer attractive enough rates. Uh, um, I would, when we're looking at a business, we're looking at holding it forever. And, and we want to be sure we're getting an adequate return on capital. We don't regard what we can get on short-term rates now as adequate, but we'll still sit in, rather than bend you know, a little bit and start settling for lower rates for 30 years because rates for 30 days are so low, we would rather just sit it out and wait a while. Uh, if you uh, were to buy a business and you bought it at its intrinsic value, What's the minimum after-tax free cash flow yield you'd need to get? Well, um, uh, your question is if we were buying all of a business and we were buying it at what we thought was intrinsic value, what was the minimum? Correct. Present earning power or what the, present, the, the minimum discount rate of future streams? No, what's the uh, minimum current after-tax uh, free cash flow yield you'd we, need to get? We, we could conceivably buy a business. I don't think we, 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 we would be likely to, but we could, we could conceivably buy a business that had no current after-tax uh, cash flow, but we would have to think it was, had a, a tremendous future. But the, we would not find, obviously, the, the, the current figures, particularly in the kind of businesses we buy, tend to be representative, we think, of what's ha going to happen in the future. But but that would not necessarily have to be the case. Uh, uh, you can argue, <clears throat> for example, in buying stocks, we bought Geico at a time when it uh, was losing significant money. Uh, uh, we didn't expect it to continue to lose significant money, but, but if, we think, if we think the present value of the future earning power is attractive enough compared to the purchase price, we would not, we would not be, we would not be uh, overwhelmed by what the first year's figure would be. Uh, Charlie, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, we don't care what we report in the first year or two of uh, after buying anything. Well, I would say that that uh, in a world of seven percent long-term bond rates, that. Uh, we would certainly want to think we were discounting future after-tax streams of cash at, at, at at least a 10 percent rate. But that, that will depend on, on the certainty we feel about the business. The more certain that we feel about a business, uh, the closer we are willing to play it. We have to feel pretty certain about any business before we're even interested at all. But there, there's still degrees of, of certainty. and, and uh, uh, if we thought we were getting a, a stream of, of cash over the next 30 years that we felt extremely certain about, we would, we would, we would use a discount rate that would be somewhat, what, somewhat less than if, if it was one where we thought we might get some surprises in five or 10 years, if the possibility existed. Charlie? Nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> I actually have a two-part question. I'd like to ask you to elaborate a bit how you think about opportunity costs and I'm, I think I'm going to be elaborating very much on the very last question that was asked. Uh, first of all, in the annual report, you say explicitly that you look for a 10% pre-tax return on uh, equity in looking at common stocks. And I think you talked earlier about how you built up from that for 5 to 6% um, after-tax return, and then you layer on inflation, and then t um, layer on taxes. My first question would be, how do you adjust that uh, required rate of return 
across periods of time. So, for example, when interest rates are higher, and do you look for a different equity uh, premium return over different periods of time? My second question would be, Warren, you just said that you actually would apply the same discount rate across the stocks. And I'm sure you know that modern finance actually suggests that you should not do that, that you should be thinking about the timing of cash flows and in particular the covariance with the general market. Now, you've made a point of emphasizing that when you think of risk, you think of risk primarily in terms of will you get the cash flows that you predict you will get over time, sort of numerator risk if you think in terms of discounted cash flow, which I think everyone here will have to acknowledge your results speak for themselves has probably been a very effective way of thinking about risk. But there is a true economic cost to think about the timing of cash flows as well, and it may be a much smaller cost, but it is still a real cost. I might, for example, suggest you think about somebody deciding between two jobs. The jobs are completely identical, and he, uh, the person expects to make the same amount of money from each job, but there's one difference. And the difference is one job will pay him more when the economy is in the tank, and the other job will pay him more when the economy is going gangbusters. Now, if he asked you which job was actually worth more, my guess is you would tell him that the one that would pay him more when the economy is in the tank. And the reason is, if he wanted to make more money by moonlighting or doing something else, it'd be much easier when the economy is doing better. That's the essential logic behind the idea that you look at the covariance of when um, cash flows come in with the overall market. It's a real cost, even though it is difficult to measure. And even if it is a smaller risk than numerator risk, the risk of getting the actual cash flows, since it's a real cost, I imagine you must think about it. And so my second question to you would be, how do you think about it? And if you decide not to, why? The, the question on, on opportunity costs and the 10% we mentioned, you know, basically that's, that's the figure we quit on. And we quit on buying, we don't want to buy equities where our real expectancy is below 10%. Now that's true whether short rates are 6% or whether short rates are 1%. We just feel that, that it would get very sloppy to start dipping below that and we would add we feel also obviously that we will get opportunities that are at least at that level and perhaps substantially above so there's just a point at which we drop out of the game and it's arbitrary there's no we have no scientific studies or anything but i will bet you that a lot of years in the future we we or you will be able to find equities that uh that you understand or we understand and that have a probability uh, the probability of returns at 10 percent or greater. Now, once you gr find a group of equities in that range, now and, and leaving aside the problem of huge sums of money which we have, uh, then we just buy the most attractive. That usually means the ones we feel the surest about. I mean, as a, as a practical matter, that, uh, there's just some businesses that possess economic characteristics that make their future prospects far out, far more predictable than others. There's all kinds of businesses that you just can't, you can't remotely predict uh, what they'll earn, and you just have to forget about them. But when we get, so we, we have over time gotten very partial to the businesses uh, where we think the predictability is high, but we still want a threshold return of 10%, which is not that great after tax, Anyway, uh, Charlie, do you want to comment on that portion of the that question first? Yeah, the I think in the last analysis, everything we do comes back to opportunity cost. But to some extent, in fact, to some considerable extent, we are guessing at our future opportunity cost. Warren is basically saying that he's guessing that he'll have opportunities in due course to, to uh, put out money at pretty attractive rates of return, and therefore he's not going to waste a lot of firepower now at lower returns. But that's an opportunity cost calculation. And if interest rates were to more or less permanently settle at 1% or something like that, and Warren were to reappraise his notions of future opportunity cost, he would change the numbers. Like Keynes said, what do you do when you change your view of the facts? Uh, well, you change your conduct. Uh, but so far, at least, uh, 
we have hurdles in our mind which are basically, well, they, they involve implicitly future opportunity cost. Right now, with our 16 billion that's getting one and a quarter percent pre-tax, that's $200 million a year. We could very easily buy governments uh, due in, in 20 years and get roughly 5%. So we could change that 200 million a year to 800 million a year of income. And we're making a decision, as Charlie says, that it's better to take 200 million for a while on the theory that we'll find something that gives us 10% or better than to commit to the 800 million a year uh, and then find that in a year thereabouts when the better opportunities came along that the, what we had committed to had a big principal loss in it. But that's, you know, that, that's not, uh, it's not, it's not terribly scientific, uh, but it, all I can tell you is in practice it's, it, it seems to work pretty well. Uh, second question would be, uh, in terms of a discount rate, do you feel it's appropriate to use uh, your cost of capital or the current risk-free rate? question about a discount rate, when you talk about our cost of capital, that's worth bringing up because Charlie and I don't have the faintest idea what our cost of capital is at Berkshire, and we think the whole concept is a little crazy, frankly. But it's, it's something that's taught in the business schools, and you have to be able to answer the questions or you don't get out of business school. Uh, but we have, a, we have a very simple arrangement in terms of what we do with, with, with money, and, and uh, uh, you know, we look for the most intelligent thing we can find to do if we've got money around or if, or if we look, we don't buy and sell businesses this way, but in terms of securities, we would, we would, uh, we would uh, if we find something that's at 50 percent of value and we own something else at 90 percent of value, we might very well move from one to another. Uh, we will do the most intelligent thing we can with the capital we have. and. Uh, so we measure alternatives against each other, and we measure alternatives against dividends, and we measure alternatives against repurchase of shares. But I have never seen a cost of capital calculation that made sense to me. How about you, Charlie? Never. And this is a very interesting thing that's happened. If you take the most powerful freshman text in economics, which is by Mankiw of Harvard, and uh, he says on the, practically the first page that intelligent people make their decisions based on opportunity cost. In other words, it's your alternatives that are competing for the use of your time or money that matter in judging whether you take action or not. And of course, those vary greatly from time to time and from company to company. And we tend to make all of our financial decisions based on our opportunity costs, just as I like they teach in freshman economics. Yeah. And the I, rest of the world has gone off on some crazy kick where they can create a standard formula, and that's, and that's cost. They even get a cost of equity capital for some business that's old and filthy rich. It, it's a perfectly amazing uh, mental malfunction. <laughs> Number three, is there anybody we've forgotten to offend? At the <laughs> I'd like to follow up on the question from the gentleman from Australia and from Munich on valuation. Uh, the gentleman from Australia asked about margin of safety, and you re replied that a superior business may not require that much of a margin of safety. My follow-up would be is, does that suggest market rate of returns going forward for superior businesses? And then on the Munich valuation, which you cited a farm example on discounted cash flows, I'm very curious how you come up with your discount rate and how you might adjust that discount rate based upon various businesses. You might want to discuss your discount rates used for Coca-Cola, J&J, &J, or some of your past investments. Yeah, we Thank don't you. we don't formally have discount rates. I mean, every time I start talking about all this stuff, Charlie reminds me that I've never prepared a spreadsheet. But I do, you know, in, in effect, in my mind, I do. But uh, we are going to want to get a significantly higher return, obviously, in terms of cash produced relative to the amount we're outlaying now, 
for a business than we are from a government bond. I mean, we, you know, we are going to, that, that has to be the yardstick at a base. Then how much more do we want? Well, if government bond rates were 2 percent, we're not going to buy a business to earn 3 or 3.5 percent expectancy over the years. We just don't want to commit our money that way. We'd rather sit around and wait a little while. Uh, if they're four and three quarters percent, you know, what do we hope to get over time? Well, we want to get a fair amount more than that. But I can't, I can't tell you that we sit down every morning and, and I call Charlie in Los Angeles and say, what's our hurdle rate today? I mean, we have never used the term. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a little bit of the, the, we want enough so that we feel very comfortable if they, close on the stock market for a couple of years, if interest rates go up another 100 basis points or 200 basis points, we're still happy with what we've bought. And above that, I really, you know, I know it sounds kind of fuzzy, but it is fuzzy. Charlie? Yeah, the concept of a hurdle rate makes nothing but sense, and yet a lot of terrible errors are made by people who are talking about hurdle rates. Uh, just because you can measure something and guess it doesn't mean that it's the controlling variable in what you're dealing with in a messy world. And uh, I don't think there's any substitute for thinking a whole, about a whole lot of investment options and thinking about why one is better than another and what the likely returns are from each, et cetera, et cetera. And the trouble with the hurdle rate concept, not that we don't have one in a sense, uh, is that it doesn't work as well as, as a system of comparing things. In other yeah. words, if, if I have something available that I think will give me 8% for sure, and I can buy all I want of it, and you've got a perfectly good investment that I think will earn 7 I don't have to waste five minutes with you. You're like the mail order service offering the bride through the mail and she's got AIDS. You know, I can go on to some different subject. And, and, it, it, and so this, the concept of opportunity cost is, it, it's so little taught in investment. They teach it in the freshman course in economics in all the major universities, but when you get to the corporate finance departments and so forth, it doesn't lend itself to them kind of mathematics they want to use, so they ignore it. But in the real world, your opportunity costs are what you want to make your decisions based on. Yeah, and even if you were, if you had something that you were really familiar with and were very sure on the 8%, 8.5% wouldn't tempt you if somebody came along. That's a practical matter for you. Sure. It, it, I've been on, as I mentioned, I've been on 19 corporate boards. I would say that of the presentations I've seen, and I've seen a lot of them, and every one of them had a calculation of internal rate of return. You know, if they'd burned them all, the boards would have been better off. I mean, it, 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 there is so much nonsense presented because the presenters essentially know what the listeners are desirous of hearing and what is needed in order to get through something that the CEO wants to do anyway. That you just, it, it's just, you just get nonsense figures and. Uh, you know, we may get nonsense figures too, but they're ours. You know, we, uh, let, me, let me give you an example of that. I have a young friend who sells private partnership interests to investors, and he's in a really tough field where it's hard to get decent returns. And I said, what return do you tell them you're aiming for? And he said, 20%. And he said, how did you pick that number? He said, if I chose any lower number, they wouldn't give me the money. And there's no one in the world we think can earn 20% with big money. I mean, it just, so anybody making a promise like that, basically, we, we're going to write off immediately. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing to me what, you know, in a sense, how gullible big investors are, pension funds and so on, and that they... They have people come around and uh, promise them the Holy Grail, and they want it so badly, you know, that they're willing to believe things that just have to be nonsense. When interest rates go from zero to negative in a country, how does that change the way that you value a company or a stock? Do you choose a high valuation because the discount rate is, high, is low, 
or on the other hand, you choose a low valuation because the cash flow is likely to be poor? Well, going from, which we haven't done in this country yet, but going from zero to minus a half is really no different than going from four to three and a half. Or, I mean, it, it, it has a different feel to it, obviously, if you, if you, if you uh, have to pay a half a point to somebody. But if you, if you have your yield or your base rate reduced by half a point, uh, it's of some significance, but it isn't dramatic. What's dramatic is interest rates being where they are generally. I mean, whether it's zero, plus a quarter, minus a quarter, plus a half, minus a half, we are dealing with a situation of essentially very close to zero interest rates, and we have been for a long time and longer than I would have anticipated. The, the nature of it is that you'll pay more for a business uh, when interest rates are zero than if they were like 15% when Volcker was around. And, and, and you can take that up and down the line. I mean, it, uh, we don't get too exact about it because it isn't that exact a science. But very cheap money makes me pay a little more for businesses than when money was at what we previously thought was normal rates. And very tight money would cause me to pay somewhat less. I mean, uh, you know, the we had a rule for 2,600 years that uh, Aesop lived around 600 B.C., but he didn't happen to know it was B.C., but, you know, you can't know everything. The, uh, um, and it was that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but a bird in the hand now is worth about nine-tenths of a bird in the bush in, in Europe, you know, because it depends on how far out the bush is, but it keeps getting worth less as you go along. So these are very unusual times that way, and if you ask me whether I paid a little more for precision cash parts because interest rates were around zero than if they'd been 6%, the answer is yes. I try not to pay too much more, but it has an effect. Uh, and uh, if interest rates continue at this rate for a long time, if people ever really start thinking something close to this is normal, that will have an enormous effect on asset values. It already has some effect. Charlie? Yeah, but I don't think anybody really knows much about negative interest rates. We never had them before. And, and we never had periods of stasis, like 20, except for the Great Depression. We, we didn't have things like happened in Japan. A great modern nation playing all the monetary tricks, Keynesian tricks, stimulus tricks, and mired in stasis for 25 years. And none of the great economists who studied this stuff and taught it to our children understand it either. So we just do the best we can. And they still don't understand it. No. And they, our advantage is that we know we don't understand it. It's really, it's interesting, though. I mean, we are, you know, it's, it's, it makes for an interesting movie. It, uh, and it does modestly affect what we pay for businesses, uh, whether, I don't think anybody expected to last this long, do you, Charlie? Personally? I don't think, everybody, if you're not confused, you haven't thought about it correctly. <laughs> yeah. question relates to owner earnings. What guidance can you give us as to the uh, calculation of item C, which is uh, maintenance capital spending and working capital requirements? Item C. Richard, I was, I was going to ask you a question. How about another company? <laughs> <laughs> Richard and uh, his wife, Alma, have, have attended, what, maybe eight or so meetings and, and uh, uh, what he did is covered in the annual uh, report, but uh, uh, if it had not been for Richard, we would uh, we would not have uh, uh, merged with uh, uh, flight safety, uh, uh, and for that we owe him a lot of thanks. Uh, now the item C, I don't remember item C. So I want to say. <laughs> He's talking about uh, maintenance expenses, yeah, and know, working but, capital, yeah, and so forth. Yeah. The, the, the compulsory reinvestment 
Oh, oh, back on the, uh, that goes back some years on that description, yeah. The, uh, in, in the case of the businesses that we're in, both wholly owned and uh, major investee companies, we regard the reported earnings with the exception of the some major purchase accounting adjustment, which will usually be an amortization of intangibles item. We regard the reported earnings, actually the reported earnings plus, plus or minus, but usually plus, purchase accounting adjustments to be a pretty good representation of the real earnings of the business. And now you can make the argument that when Coca-Cola is spending a ton of money each year in marketing and advertising that they're expensing, that really a portion of that's creating an asset just as if they were building a factory because it is it is creating more value for the company in the future in addition to doing something for them in the present. And I, I wouldn't argue with that. But of course that was true in the past too and if you'd capitalize those expenditures in those earlier years you'd be amortizing the cost of them at the present time. Um, I think with a relatively low inflation situation with the kind of businesses we own, uh, I think that reported earnings plus amortization of any, well, it's really amortization of intangibles, other purchase accounting adjustments usually aren't that important. I would say that, that they give a good representation to us of own earnings. Uh, uh, can you think of any exceptions in, in our businesses, particularly Charlie? Uh, no, we have, uh, after some unpleasant early experience, we have tried to avoid places where there was a lot of compulsory reinvestment just in order to stand still. And uh, But there are businesses out there that are still like that. It's just that we don't have any. Yeah, I would say, and one, I would say that uh, in the case of Geico, for example, the earnings the gain in intrinsic value will be substantially greater than represented by the annual earnings. Whether you, whether you want to call that extra amount of er, owner earnings or not is another question. But, but as we build float from that business, as long as it's represented by the same kind of policyholders that we've had in the past, there is an added element to the gain in intrinsic value that goes well beyond uh, the reported earnings for the year. Uh, but w whether you want to really think of that as earnings or whether you just want to think of that as an increment to intrinsic value, uh, you know, I sort of leave to you. But I, but I would say that there's no question that in our insurance business where our float was, was $20 million or so when we went into it in 1967 and where it is now that, that there have been earnings in effect through the buildup of the float that have been uh, above and beyond uh, the reported earnings that we've given to you. Uh, I think our look-through earnings are, they're, they're very rough. And we don't try to, we don't, we don't believe in carrying things out to four decimal places where, you know, we, we, we really don't know what the first digit is very well. So, uh, I don't want. I don't want to. I don't. I, I never want you to think of them as too precise. But I think they give a a good rough indication of the actual earnings that are taking place attributable our, to our to our situation every year. And I think the pace at which they move gives you a good idea as to the progress or the lack of progress that the, that we've made. The only big adjustment I would make in those is that in the supercat insurance business, we're going to have a really bad year occasionally and. And you probably should take something off all of the good years, and you probably should not regard when the bad year comes. You should not regard that as as uh, as uh, something to be projected into the future. Charlie, no more, no more. I've got another question about valuation, um, more specifically the relation of PEs to interest rates. I understand that uh, you don't want to lay down a rigid formula for. Um, for valuation, but I also know that you don't want people to think that a multiple of 20 times earnings is cheap or a multiple of five times earnings is expensive. 
Uh, so uh, Benjamin Graham, he devised a central value theory that valued the average stock at an earnings yield that's about a third above bond yields. In other words, uh, that would work out to maybe 11 times earnings currently. Um, and I know that you've compared uh, the average business to a 13% bond that's worth roughly book at 13% interest rates and worth perhaps roughly twice book at 6% interest rates. So um, given current interest rates of 7 to 8% uh, as they are now, uh, that would tend to imply that stocks are worth perhaps 12 to 13 times earnings. And yet the acquisitions that I've seen in the private market have gone out at more like 17 to 20 times earnings. Uh, and I'd like to know what do you think is the rough range of multiples that makes sense? Yeah, well, it isn't a multiple of today's earnings that is primarily determinant of things. We, we bought our Coca-Cola, for example, in 1988 and 89 on this stock at a price of $11 a share, which as low as nine, as high as 13, but it averaged about $11. And it'll earn, we'll say, most estimates are between 230 and 240 this year. So that's under five times this year's earnings, but it was a pretty good size multiple back when we bought it. It's, it's the future that counts. It's like what I wrote there, what Wayne Gretzky says, to go to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. So the current multiple, interacts with the reinvestment of capital and the rate at which that capital is invested to determine the attractiveness of something now. And uh, uh, we, are, we are affected in that valuation process uh, to a considerable degree by interest rates, but not by whether they're 7.3 or 7.0 or 7.5. But I mean, I, we will be thinking much differently if their long-term rates are 11% or 5%, and, uh, uh, but we don't have any magic multiples in mind. We, we're, we're thinking we want to be in the business that 10 years from now is earning a whole lot more money than it is now, and that we will still feel good about the prospects of the business at that time. That's the kind of business we're trying to buy all of, and that's the kind of business that we try and buy part of. And then sometimes we buy others too. <laughs> Charlie? We don't do any of that rigid formulaic stuff. No. There's a general framework that you can call a formula in our mind, but we also don't kid ourselves that we know so much about the specifics that we would actually make a calculation in terms of a, the equation. When we bought Coke in 88 and 89, we, we had this idea about what we thought the business would do over time, but we never reduced it to making a calculation. Maybe we should, but it, I mean, it just, it just uh, we don't think there's that kind of precision. Do we, th we think it's the right way to think in a general way, and we think if you try to, if you think that you can do it to pinpoint it, you're kidding yourself, and therefore we think that when we make a decision, there ought to be such a margin of safety that it ought to be so attractive that you don't have to carry it out to three decimal places. I have a question. When you're valuing the companies and you discount back the future earnings that you talked about, how many years out do you generally go? And if you don't go out a general number of years, how do you arrive at that time period? Well, that's that's a, a very good question, and it's it's I mean it's the heart of investing or buying businesses, which we regard as the same thing. But and it is the framework in which we operate. I mean, we are trying to look at businesses in terms of what kind of cash can they produce if we're buying all of them, or will they produce if we're buying part of them? And there's a difference. Uh, and then at what discount rate do we do we bring it back? And, and the, I think your question was how far out do we look and all that. Despite the fact that we can define that in, in a very kind of simple and direct equation, you know, we are, we, we've never actually sat down and, and, and written out a set of numbers that uh, to relate that equation. We do it in our heads in a way, uh, obviously. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. But uh, there's no piece of paper, uh, and, and, and we never, there never was a piece of paper that shows what our calculation on Hellsbergs or Seas Candy or the Buffalo News was in that respect. Uh, so it would be attaching a little more scientific uh, quality to our analysis than there really is if I gave you 
some gobbledygook about, well, we do it for 18 years and stick a terminal value on and do all of this. Uh, we are sitting at the, in the office thinking about that question with each business or each investment. And we, we have discount rates in, in a general way in mind, but uh, we really like the decision to be obvious enough to us that it doesn't require making a detailed calculation. And, and uh, uh, it's the framework, but it's not applied in the sense that we actually fill in all the variables. Is that a fair way of stating it, Chairman? Yeah, Berkshire is, is, is being run the way Thomas Hunt Morgan, the great Nobel laureate, ran the biology department at Caltech. He banned the Frieden calculator, which was the computer of that era. And people said, how can you do this? Every place else in Cal Caltech, we have Frieden calculators going everywhere. And he said, well, we're picking up these great nuggets of gold just by organized common sense, and resources are short and we're not gonna resort to any damn placer mining as long as we can pick up these major aggregations of gold. Uh, that's the way Berkshire works, and I hope the placer mining era will never come. Somebody once subpoenaed our staffing papers on some acquisition, and of course, not only did we not have any staffing papers, we didn't have any staff. <laughs> <laughs> My question has to do with estimating the intrinsic value of a company, in particular the capital intensive companies like you were mentioning. I'm thinking of things like McDonald's and Walgreens, but there are lots of others where you have a very healthy and growing operating cash flow, but it's largely or completely offset by heavy expenditures on putting up new stores or restaurants or building a new plant. And so my question is, what do you do for your estimate of future free cash flow? And with treasuries around, long treasuries around seven, six percent, at what rate do you discount those cash flows? Well, we discount at the long rate just, just to have a standard of measurement across all businesses. but. We would take the company that is spending the money as it comes in, and 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 uh, they don't get credit for for gross cash flow. They get credit for whatever net cash is get left every year. But of course, if they're spending the money wisely, even though you have to discount it for more years, uh, the growth in, in 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 cash development should offset that, or they weren't investing it wisely. The best business is one that gives you more and more money every year without putting up anything uh, uh, to get it, or very little. And we've got some businesses like that. The second best business is a business that also gives you more and more money. It, it takes more money, but the rate at which you invest, reinvest the money to get that growth is, is a very satisfactory rate. The worst business of all is the one that grows a lot and where you're forced in Forced, in effect, forced to grow to stay in the game at all, and where you're reinvesting uh, the capital at a very low rate of return. Uh, and uh, sometimes people are in those businesses without knowing about it. But in, in terms of discounting, in terms of, of calculating intrinsic value, you look at the cash that is expected to be generated, and you discount back. In our case, we use the long-term treasury rate. That doesn't pay, mean that you pay the amount that's, that's, that, that that present value calculation leads to, but it means that you use that as a common yardstick, that, that treasury rate. And that means if somebody is reinvesting all their cash flow the next five years, they better have some very big figures coming in down the road, because if someday a financial asset has to give you back cash to justify you laying out cash for now, for it now. Investing is, is the art essentially, of laying out cash now to get a whole lot more cash later on, and, and something at some point better deliver cash. Ben Graham in his class, used to, we used to talk about what he called the Frozen Corporation. And the Frozen Corporation was a company whose charter prohibited it from ever paying anything to its owners, or ever being liquidated, or ever being sold. And Sort of like a Hollywood producer. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the question was, what, what was such an enterprise worth? Well, that's sort of a 
theoretical question, but it, it, it forced you to think about the realities of, of what business is all about. And business is all about putting out money today to get back more money later on. Charlie? I do think there is uh, an interesting problem that you raise, because I think there is a class of businesses uh, where the eventual cash back part of the equation tends to be an illusion. I think there are businesses where you just keep pouring it in and pouring it in, and, and uh, then all of a sudden it doesn't work and no cash comes back. And what makes our life interesting is trying to avoid those and get an the alternative kind that drowns you in cash. The one, the one figure we regard as utter nonsense is the so-called EBITDA. Or, I mean, the idea of looking at a figure before the cash requirements of merely staying in the same place, and there usually are, any business with significant fixed assets you, almost always has with it a, a concomitant uh, requirement that major cash be be reinvested in order to simply to stay in the same place competitively and, and in terms of unit sales. To look at some figure that, that is before, uh, that, that is stated before those cash requirements is, is absolute folly and it's been misused by lots of people who sell lots of merchandise in, in recent years. It's not to the credit of the investment banking fraternity that it has learned to speak in terms of EBITDA. I mean, the idea of, of using a measure you, that you know is nonsense and then piling additional reasoning on that false assumption, it, it, it's not creditable intellectual performance. And then once everybody is talking in terms of nonsense, why, well, it gets to be standard. <laughs> and years ago when Warren ran a partnership, and to some extent, the partnership that I ran was the, operated in the same way. We implicitly did what you're suggesting in that part of the partnership funds were in so-called event arbitrage investments. And those tended to generate returns occasionally when the market generally was in the tank. And alternative investments uh, would more mimic the general market. So we were doing what this academic theory prescribes, you know, 40 years ago. And, uh, but we didn't use the modern lingo. Yeah, we've got some preferences for having a lot of money coming in all the time. Uh, yeah. But we do go into, into insurance transactions with huge volatility, uh, which could mean that a, a big chunk of money could go out at, at one time or in a very short period of time. Uh, and we won't give up a lot in expectable return for smoothness. But if you give us a choice of having money come in every week and the, pre and the same present value of money coming in in very lumpy ways that we wouldn't know about, we would choose the smooth. But if you give us a choice of a higher present value for the lumpiness, we will take the lumpiness. And that's usually the choice that's, I mean, that's usually, we get offered that choice and other people value smoothness so highly that we do get a spread, in our view, for lumpy returns. Um, you say that companies should only spend dollar on capital expenditures if it will create more than one dollar of market value. I'm wondering, how do you determine this? Is it based on A, historical returns on capital, B, a qualitative judgment of the company's competitive position, C, a quantitative projection of the returns on capital, or D, something else? Well, it's based on all of those factors you mentioned and, and more, but in the end, uh, we can say, to date, every dollar we've retained has been worthwhile because I've, on balance, those dollars uh, have produced more than a dollar of market value. And, and, and uh, it's Actually, with a great many companies, you could, you could say that now because uh, things have turned out so well. But uh, it would be a case, the, the check on it is if over every, if after three or four years, you have found that the dollars we retained haven't created more of that in value, then, then the presumption becomes very strong at that point that we should start uh, paying out money. Uh, uh, but 
almost any management that wants to retain money is going to rationalize it by saying we're going to do wonderful things with the money we retain. And, and we think there should be checks on that, which is why in the report, in the ground rules, I suggest making checks uh, on the validity of those projections. Uh, Charlie and I, if you ask us today whether the single dollar we retain from the earnings today we've got a use for today that will produce a more than a dollar value, the answer is no. We do think that based on history uh, that the prospects are the better than 50 percent, well over 50 percent, that in the next few years we would have an opportunity to do that. But there's no certainty to it. Charlie? Nothing more. I wondered if you could comment on a subject I don't think you like to talk about very much, which is intrinsic value. And the evolution over the past 10 or 12 years of going to uh, off and on, but giving us in, in investments and then giving us the operating income and suggesting that might be a good guide to us. I find it extremely helpful. Uh, I'm not sure other people do when looking out the 20 years you're talking about, looking ahead on both those two parts. Any comments you might have, I'd surely appreciate. Yeah, well, the intrinsic value of, of Berkshire, uh, like any other business, is based on the future amount of cash that can be expected to be delivered by the business between now and Judgment Day, discounted back at the proper rate. Now, that's pretty nebulous. Another way of looking at it is to try and figure out the value of the businesses we own presently, and we try to give you the information that will enable you to make a reasonably close estimate of that. We own lots of marketable securities. It's probably safe to say that, that, it, that they are worth more or less what they are carried for. And then we own a number of operating businesses, and we try to give you the figures on those businesses that are the figures that we use in, in making our own judgments about the value of those businesses. Now, that tells you what, what we have today and more or less what it's worth. But since Berkshire retains all of its earnings, it becomes very important to evaluate what will be done with those earnings over time. I mean, it, it, it is not only a question of what the present businesses are worth, it's a, it's a judgment on the, on the efficiency or the effectiveness with which retained earnings will be used. If you had looked at the intrinsic value of Berkshire in 1965, we had a textile business that was probably worth about $12 a share. Uh, but that was not the only part of the equation because we intended to use any cash generated to try and buy into better businesses than we had, and we were fortunate enough to be able to buy in the insurance business in 1967 and build on that. So it was not only a combination of the business we had, but the skill with which retained earnings would be used that determined uh, what the present value actually should have been at Berkshire going back that far. It's the same situation today. We will put to work billions and billions of dollars this year, next year, the year after. If we put that to work effectively, each dollar has a greater present value than a dollar has in simply in cash or distributed. If we, if we do it ineffectively, it, it has a value of something less. The businesses today, you know, we have, whatever the figure is in the annual report, uh, roughly $80,000 in marketable securities. If our insurance business breaks even, that $80,000 is free to us in terms of using it. And we have a group of operating businesses and we show their earnings in the, in the report and we're going to try and add to those and they'll try to add to their earnings. Um, but if Charlie and I were each right now to write down on a piece of paper what we think the intrinsic value of Berkshire is, our figures would not be the same. They'd be reasonably close. Uh, and uh, I think with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie. <laughs> yeah, what's hard to judge at Berkshire is the, is the likelihood that you'll have anything like the past to look forward to in the future. Berkshire has gotten very extreme in terms of investment results. In fact, it's gotten so extreme that it's 
hard to think of another similar precedent in the history of the world. And the, the balance sheet is, is gross considering uh, the small beginnings of the place. Now, what on earth has caused this extreme record to go on for such a very long time? I would argue that the young man who was reading everything he could read when he was 10 years old uh, became a learning machine and he got a lot of power early and then he got a very long run when he kept learning. If Warren had uh, not been learning all the while, I'm telling you, having watched the process closely, the record would be a pale shadow of what it is and Warren has improved since he passed the retirement age of man. In other words, in, in this field at least, you can improve when you're old. Now, most people don't even try and create that kind of a record. They pass power from one 65-year-old to one 59-year-old and then do it over and over again. But you get an enormous advantage from practice in this field. And so what happened accidentally in the case of Warren has helped you shareholders greatly because you had this long run with power extremely concentrated and, uh, and with the man holding the power being a ferocious learner. Uh, our, our system ought to be more copied than it is. This idea of, uh, of passing the power from one old codger to another in a settled way is not necessarily the right system at all. We, we have a very strong culture now of, of rationality of being owner oriented that will go on long after I'm not around uh, and and we have the talent on the operating side in place to do a lot of wonderful things over time we we will need in capital allocation to keep doing intelligent things we won't get to do brilliant things because you don't get to do brilliant things with the kind of sums we're talking about. Maybe once in a blue moon or something, you know, you'll get a chance. But we will need somebody uh, that never does it, basically doesn't do any dumb things and occasionally does something that's, that's reasonably good. That can be done. And, and we have, we're on that road all the, already. Uh, it is not fitting into this organization as an investment officer or a capital allocator you're getting in the right vehicle. It has the right standards. It will reject ideas that, that really are irrational. I, I've been on a lot of boards. Charlie's been on a lot of boards. You would be amazed at the number of things that are responding to animal spirits rather than to rationality that take place. And we have our animal spirits, but we devote them to other areas. Uh, uh, you mentioned in, in terms of our clues, we try to give you all of the information that we would find useful ourselves in evaluating uh, Berkshire's intrinsic value. Uh, in our reports, uh, you know, I can't think of anything we leave out that if Charlie and I uh, had been away for a year and we were trying to figure out, look at the look at the situation fresh, evaluate things. There's, um, you know, there. there there's, there's nothing, in my view, left out of our published materials. Now, one important element in Berkshire, which is a secondary factor that gets into what you're talking about there, is that because we retain all earnings and because we have a growth of float over time, we have a considerable amount of money to invest. And it really is the success with which we invest those retained earnings and growth and float that will have an important fact, be an important factor in how fast our intrinsic value grows. And to an important extent, the, what happens there is out of our control. I mean, it, it does depend on the markets in which we operate. So if our, if our earnings plus float growth equals $3 billion or something like that in a current year, whether that $3 billion gets put to terrific use, satisfactory use, or no use at all virtually, really depends to a big extent on external factors. It also depends on, to some extent, on our, uh, our energy and, and, and insights and so on. But it's, 
the external world makes a big difference in the reinvestment rate. And, you know, your guess is as good as ours on that. But uh, if we run into favorable external circumstances, the ex your calculation of, of intrinsic values should uh, w would result in a higher number than if we run into the kind of circumstances that we've had the last 12 months. Charlie? Yeah, for many decades around here, we've had roughly 100 percent, more than 100 percent of book net worth in marketable securities and had a lot of wonderful uh, wholly owned subsidiaries to boot. And, uh, and, and we've always had a very attractive place to put new money in as we generate it. Well, we still got the wonderful businesses, but we're having trouble with the new money. So well, it's not oh, trouble, right. really, to have a pile of lovely money. This is not. I don't think there should be tears in the house. Have you ever run into any unlovely money, Charlie? <laughs> I weathered if it was appropriate for me to describe the methodology in which I'm trying to determine the range of Berkshire's intrinsic value, and if you can guide me on if my methodology is flawed or is reasonably accurate. If, if it doesn't take too long, we'll be glad to. Although I think I know the answer already. <laughs> Okay, uh, we, we ended 2003 with about 5.422 billion of operating earnings. I estimated our look-through earnings to be approximately 915 million. So in total, that was about 6.337 billion of estimated look-through earnings. I knew that we spent a billion two on CapEx and our net depreciation on tangible assets was 829 million. So, so there was a difference there of 173 million. And we spent more on CapEx over the depreciation over the last few years. But in extrapolating out 20 years, I thought I might be kidding myself to ascertaining the differences between CapEx and depreciation and I'm using look-through earnings as a rough proxy for distributable earnings. And I've assumed that Berkshire can grow its look-through earnings at 15% per annum from years one to five, and at 10% per annum from years six to 20, and the business will stop growing after year 20, resulting in a 7% coupon from year 21 onwards. I discounted the cumulative flows in years 1 to 20 by 7%, and I discounted the terminal value by 7%. I added the two together to get what I thought was the intrinsic value of Berkshire's cash stream. I knocked off 103 billion of liabilities and minority interest. I divided by 1,537,000 shares to arrive at what I thought was a conservative calculation of the range of Berkshire's intrinsic value. Am I off the mark, or is that the sort of methodology you might use yourself? Well, <laughs> well, you've done your homework. <laughs> the, uh, the line of thinking is correct. It just depends on what variables you plug in, and, and we might have different ideas on variables and neither one of us knows, but the approach in general, the, 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 the approach of trying to figure out distributable cash over a period of time, the, the business today is worth the present value at some number, well, you're using 7%, but the question what number to use, but it's worth the present value of all the cash it can distribute between now and Judgment Day, and if if cash can be retained and it's at a rate higher, it produces at a rate higher than your discount rate. Obviously, uh, you'll get some benefit from that retention. But you know, I, I would uh, 
I would say that your assumptions about CapEx and, and, and uh, related to depreciation, I would expect CapEx to, just, to be on average a little more than depreciation unless we run into highly inflationary times. But of course, we have to keep buying businesses and using the capital in the business that we retain. If we retain those earnings, we have to use that to buy more businesses. And then the question is, what kind of returns can we expect on those? I don't, I don't quarrel with, I don't quarrel with the approach you're using. But you know, everybody has to do their own equation and plug in some numbers. And I think uh, we might settle for for lower numbers on on earnings gains than you've postulated because we're very large and it's, it, it's, it's, it gets harder all the time to deploy the kind of funds that keep keep flowing into Omaha. Charlie? Yeah, and you shouldn't necessarily get overly excited about last year. As Warren course, said, that is a, uh, it was a very unusual year when everything worked together pretty, pretty darn well. Except interest rates on yeah mm -hmm. well but but a lot worked together very well. The interesting thing about Berkshire's present valuation is how much cash and cash equivalents it has to do something, and that is a very interesting question. How well are we going to do with this massive amount of investable cash and cash cash equivalents? Yeah, we should be out working now. I mean, it, it, <laughs> That, that is the test. I mean, we've got a bunch of good businesses. We've got a lot of money that we'd like to use to buy more good businesses. We may get lucky and, and, and uh, deploy that quite rapidly. Uh, we may wait a long time. Uh, it, cash may pile up faster than we can use it, in which case we'll have to rethink the whole game. But our hope is, and so far we've, we feel okay about what's happened in that. Our hope is that we can, re can deploy the money that flows in at in businesses that are come close to being as good as the ones that we've bought over the years. At Berkshire, what counts most are increases in our normalized per share earning power. And that was in our la your last letter. What is our normalized per share earning power, as you estimate it? Well, I would say that what you saw in the first quarter under these tax rates would probably be a, a reasonable guess. Uh, you know, obviously it depends on the economy in any given year. I would say that would is a, a reasonable estimate, but we have firepower we haven't used and we'll have more firepower as we go along. So we do expect that normalized earning power to increase over the, over time. And if, if it doesn't, you know, one way or another, we're failing you because we're retaining those earnings. So uh, I don't see anything abnormal in our earnings figured now at a 21% federal rate. But as I look at the five and a quarter billion in the first quarter, seasonally insurance is better in the first quarter, but seasonally most of our businesses the first quarter is not the strongest quarter for us. I, I don't see anything abnormal in it. And then I think you can expect, you should expect, we expect substantial capital gains over time in addition to what comes from the operating businesses. So how much you figure in for that, uh, I would say that the, the retained earnings beyond dividends of our 770 billion of equities, in other words, how much they are keeping from us, but that our share of the earnings, which can be used by them, whether it's Apple or American Express or Coca-Cola or, or Wells Fargo or whatever, I, our share you know, is, is in many billions of dollars annually. And one way or another, we think that those dollars will benefit us as much as if they'd been paid out. Now, in certain cases they won't, but in certain cases they'll, they'll excel the amount uh, in terms of market value created. So there's many billions of dollars we are not showing in our earnings that is being retained by the, our investees 
And one way or another, I think we'll get value received out of those. So you can take 20 or 21 billion under present tax rates, present economic conditions, and uh, and then we should get something from that, and we should get more when we get we get 100 billion of cash invested, and we should get more as we retain earnings. So we hope it adds up to a bigger number as we go along. Charlie. <laughs> Well, I don't think our shareholders are going to see another increase in net worth of $65 billion in a single year. They may have to wait a while for another. But I don't think that, I think eventually there another will come and then another. Just be patient. <laughs> yeah, we don't regard the present situation as, um, you know, as disadvantageous, except we'd like to get more money out. But we, we like the businesses we have. We like the businesses that we own part of. We are not reflecting in the way we look at earnings. The dividends we get from those partially owned companies uh, falls far short of what they're going to contribute in our view to Berkshire's overall earnings over time. We wouldn't own those stocks otherwise. And they, so. Uh, and you also like the Apple and airline stocks you've recently purchased better than the cash you parted with. Absolutely, yeah. And that's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many businesses are reporting rising costs and surcharges on such inputs as fuel, metals, and wood. They are often unable to pass along these costs to their consumers. If commodities stabilize at price levels above those of the past decade, will corporate margins be compromised into the future? Well, it's a great question. I would say that that would depend very much on the industry you're talking about. But uh, in our carpet business, for example, we've just been hit time after time, as I mentioned in the annual report, with uh, raw material increases because there's a big petroleum uh, derivative factor there. And we have lagged in terms of being able to put through those increases to our customers uh, simply because uh, we want to <clears throat> protect uh, the Nebraska, fur <clears throat> Nebraska Furniture March or those that have ordered for a reasonable period of time. Uh, and that's squeezed margins in, in carpet. Uh, we use lots of natural gas in, at Johns Manville, we use lots of natural gas at Acme Brick, and that's tended to squeeze margins some. I think over time, uh, I think there has been a lot more inflation in these basic materials. Steel has been off the chart. I think, I think uh, <clears throat> over time, the businesses with strong competitive positions managed to pass through increases in raw material costs just as they passed through increases in labor costs. But you get these temporary situations where, where sometimes the costs are increasing faster. I, 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 don't think Amer I don't think the American industry, I mean, a, a higher cost for oil when we import 10 million barrels a day or more of oil, if we're paying $20 or so more per barrel than we were a year or two ago, <clears throat> that's $200 million a day is a tax. But it's a, more of a tax on the American consumer probably than on American business. The American business will probably be able to pass through uh, most of those raw material cost increases. It is worth pointing out that corporate profits as a percentage of GDP are right at the all-time high, leaving out a few aberrational periods. And I would, ex you know, if I had to bet on the direction of corporate profits as a percentage of GDP over the next five years, I would bet they would go down somewhat. But that's because they're right at this very, yeah, very high level Interestingly enough, while corporate profits as a percentage of GDP are at this very high level, corporate taxes as a percentage of total taxes raised in America are very close to an all-time low. So American businesses managed to pull off uh, a situation where they're making extremely good profits and paying a very small percentage of the total tax bill as measured in this country historically. And I'm not sure whether that could or, or should or, or will continue. Uh, 
Um, but it's a very, very favorable period right now for corporate America. But that, that's nothing to get bullish about because uh, you might expect some, something of a reversion to the mean. Charlie? Well, I can't add to that, but I can restate it. It's hard to know just which companies can pass through the increases in costs that come from higher commodity prices. And uh, it's also important to know. We like buying, buying businesses where we feel that there's some untapped pricing power. We haven't been able to do much of that lately. But back in 1972, when we bought C's Candy, I think it was either, was it at honor 95 a pound? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And they were selling 16 million pounds of candy a year, making 4 million pre-tax with about 25 million purchase price, which I would have very foolishly refused to budge on and in, in history and cost us a lot of money. But one of the questions we asked ourselves, and we thought the answer was obvious, was, you know, if, if we raised the price 10 cents a pound, would sales fall off a cliff? And of course, the answer, in our view at least, was that no, there was some untapped pricing power uh, in the product. And it's, it, it's not a great business when you have to have a prayer session uh, before you raise your prices a penny. I mean, it, uh, you were in a tough business then. And um, I, would, uh, I would say you can almost measure the strength of a business over time by the agony they go through in determining whether a price increase can be sustained. And frankly, a good example of that is the newspaper business right now, because 30 years ago, when the, whatever the local daily would be, had a, an absolute lock on the economics of the community, because it had the megaphone through which merchants had to talk if they were going to get their message across to, to their audience. At that time, rate increases, both circulation and advertising, were something that were almost a big yawn to most publishers. They did it annually. They did not worry about the fact that, that Sears or Walmart or Pennies or whomever would pull their advertising. They did not worry that people would drop their, their uh, subscriptions to the paper. And they went merrily along, increasing prices, and they increased them when newsprint went up, and they increased them when newsprint went down. And it worked. And you got these very fat profit margins, and, and it looked like about as strong a business as you can imagine. Now publishers find themselves in a position where they agonize over rate increases, either, both in advertising and in circulation, because they're worried about driving away advertisers into other media, and they're worried about people when they get a 20 cent an increase you know, per month or whatever it may be in their circulation price, just deciding, well, I think I'll just drop it. And when they drop it, they don't usually take it up again. So that world has changed, and you could recognize the change in that world simply if you could get inside the mind of the publisher in terms of how they felt about price increases. You can learn a lot about, you can learn a lot about the durability of the economics of a business by observing the behavior of uh, the pr price behavior. I mean, you're seeing that, we're talking about the beer business, you know, the beer has moved up in price every year, but, but there have been some rollbacks in certain, in certain areas in the last year, which means that, you know, it's getting a little bit more difficult to increase prices, even though they increase them at rates below inflation. And uh, those are not, that's not a good economic sign. Charlie? Uh, I have nothing to add to that. Mm. I've asked you questions in the past about silver, and I didn't really get them answered, so I thought I'd ask about a different commodity this time. Um, I raising the price of tungsten, and I think about your comment last year in buying Iskar. Will commodity price increases in things like tungsten affect the profitability of ISCAR? And would that be the reason you're locating a plant in China to build machine tools? Thanks. Yeah, the reason the plant was 
built in China was to serve the Chinese market, which is, is large and growing. And uh, we opened in Dalian uh, late last fall. Uh, it's nicer to be closer to the raw material, but it, it really had nothing to do uh, with changes in the price uh, uh, of, of tungsten. Generally speaking, uh, if you're creating a higher value added product, as ISCAR is doing from a raw material, uh, there may be three months, six months of adjustment to changes in raw material prices. And obviously with some commodities, if it gets high enough, you get into substitutes. But there isn't going to be any substitute for tungsten in the, in the cutting tools. And, and there won't be, sub, you know, there, there, we've tried some substitutes for, for crude oil in terms of gasoline or not so heating oil, but then the substitutes like natural gas go up in price too. So I think largely in our businesses, raw materials get passed through. Now we're having a tough time, for example, in the carpet business in passing through the cost increases that we experience in, in oil-based uh, uh, raw materials. But we would be having trouble, we'd probably be having trouble in the carpet business regardless now because of the slowdown in residential housing. It does make it tougher. But over a period of time, our businesses are going to reflect raw material costs. You know, this, this candy here, I have this fudge, which I can hardly wait to get into. Uh, you know, it's going to reflect sugar and cocoa and things like that over time. And, and if you're running an airline, it's going to reflect the cost of fuel. Uh, so you can have little squeezes here and there, but it's not a big deal. And it certainly isn't the reason that we went to China to locate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ISCAR facility. Uh, that facility, incidentally, ISCAR, uh, we have a number of people here from ISCAR and, and families in some cases. That has, I, I had very high expectations for that when we bought it. it. It succeeded in every way. It succeeded in terms of financial performance. It succeeded in terms of the human relations we've developed with the people. I mean, it was, it was. I, I told you it was a terrific acquisition a few years ago. It's been a dream acquisition, and I know Charlie wants to add to that. Yeah, I would uh, say that the short answer is that while we don't like inflation because it's bad for our country and our civilization, that we will probably make more money over time because there is inflation. You've often stated that value and growth are opposite sides of the same coin. Would you care to elaborate on that? And do you prefer a growth company that is selling cheap or a value company with with uh, moderate uh, or better uh, growth pros prospects. Well, well, actually, I think you're, you're, you may be misquoting me, but I, I really said that growth and value, uh, they're indistinguishable. They're, they're part of the same equation, or really growth is part of the value equation. So there, I, our position is that there, there is no such thing as, as growth stocks or value stocks, uh, the, the way Wall Street generally portrays them as being contrasting asset classes. Growth usually is a chance to, uh, uh, growth usually is a positive for value, but only when the, it, it, it means that by adding capital now, you add more cash availability later on at a rate that's considerably higher than the current rate of, of interest. So there is no, we don't, we, we, we calculate into any business we buy what we expect to have happen in terms of the cash that's going to come out of it or the cash that's going to go into it. As I mentioned at Flight Safety, we're going to buy $200 million worth of simulators this year. Our depreciation will probably be in the area of $70 million or thereabouts. So we're putting $130 million above depreciation into that business. Now that can be good or bad. I mean, it's growth. There's no question about it. We'll have a lot more simulators at the end of the year. But whether that's good or bad depends on what we earn on that incremental $130 million over time. So if you tell me that, that you own a business that's, that's going to grow to the sky and isn't that wonderful, I don't know whether it's wonderful or not until I know what, 
what the economics are of of that growth, how much you have to put in today and how much you will reap from putting that in today later on. And the classic case again is the airline business. The airline business has been a growth business ever since well, you know, that Orville took off. But it's the growth has been the worst thing that happened to it. It's been great for the American public. But the growth has been a curse in the in the airline business because more and more capital has been put into the business at inadequate returns. Now, growth is wonderful at seize candy because it requires relatively little like incremental investment uh, to sell more pounds of candy. So it's growth, and I've discussed this in some of the annual reports, growth is a part of the equation, but anybody that tells you you ought to have your money in growth stocks or value stocks uh, really does not understand investing. Other than that, they're terrific people. <laughs> Charlie? Well, I think it's fair to say that Berkshire, with a very limited headquarters staff, and that staff pretty old, uh, we are especially partial to laying out large sums of money under circumstances where we won't have to be smart again. In other words, if we buy good businesses, run by good people at reasonable prices, there's a good chance that you people will prosper us for many decades without more intelligence at headquarters. And you can say, in a sense, that's growth stock investing. Yeah, if you'd asked Wall Street to classify Berkshire since 1965, year by year, is this a growth business or a value business? A growth stock or value stock, you know, who knows what they would have said. But, you know, the real point is that we're trying to put out capital now to get more capital or money. We're trying to put out cash now to get more cash back later on. And if you do that, the business grows, obviously. And you can call that value or you can call it growth, but, but they're not two different categories. And uh, I just cringe. When I, when I hear people talk about now it's time to move from growth stocks to value stocks or something like that because it, it just doesn't make any sense. I own another stock which sells for four times current trailing earnings. Every quarter we get a report. Earnings go up, sales go up, cash flow goes up, the equity base expands, they gain market share, and the stock goes down. <clears throat> the company has a 60% five-year annualized growth rate and sells at four times earnings. I have two related questions. First, is this a growth stock or a value stock? And could you please give us your definitions of these terms? Second, the company sells recreational vehicles. Demographic trends in the recreation and leisure areas, RVs, cruise lines, golf equipment, etc., seem to be quite good. Do you see any opportunities for Berkshire here? <laughs> Thanks. Well, the question about growth and value is that we've, we've addressed in past annual reports, but in, in they're, they are not two distinct uh, categories of, of business. Every business is worth the present. If you knew what it was going to be able to disgorge in cash between now and Judgment Day, you could come to a precise figure as to what it is worth today. Now, elements of that uh, can be the ability to use additional capital at good rates. And most growth company, companies that are characterized as growth companies has, have that as, as a, a characteristic. But there is no distinction in our minds between growth and value. Every, every business we look at as being a value proposition, the, the potential for growth and the likelihood of good economics being attached to that growth are, are part of the equation. Uh, in, in, in evaluation, but they're all value. They're all value decisions. Uh, a company that pays no dividends, growing 100% a year, you know, is losing money now. That's that's a value decision. You have to decide how much value you're going to get. Actually, it's it's very simple. At um, the first investment primer, when would you guess it was written? The um, first investment primer that I know of and it was pretty good advice, was delivered in about 600 B.C. by Aesop. And Aesop, you'll remember, said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. 
Now, incidentally, Aesop did not know it was 600 B.C. He was smart, but he wasn't that smart. That, um, uh, now, Aesop was on to something, but he didn't finish it because there's a couple of other questions that go along with that. But it is an investment equation. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. He forgot to say exactly when you were going to get the two in the, from the bush, and he forgot to say what interest rates were that you had to measure this against. But if he'd given those two factors, he would have defined investment for the next 2,600 years because a bird in the hand uh, is, you know, you will trade a bird in the hand, which is investing, you lay out cash today, and then the question is, as an investment decision, you have to, you have to evaluate how many birds are in the bush. You may think there are two birds in the bush or three birds in the bush, and you have to decide when they're going to come out and when you're going to acquire them. Now, if interest rates are 5%, and you're going to get two birds from the bush in five years, we'll say, versus one now, uh, two birds in the bush are much better than a bird in the hand now. So you want, to, you want to trade your bird in the hand and say, I'll take two birds in the bush, because it, if you're going to get them in five years, that's roughly 14% compounded annually, and interest rates are only 5%. But if interest rates were 20%, you would decline to take two birds in, in the bush five years from now. You would say, that's not good enough, because at 20%, if I just keep this bird in my hand and compound it, I'll have more birds than two birds in the bush in five years. Now, what's all that got to do with growth? Well, usually growth, people associate with lot more birds in the bush, but you still have to decide when you're going to get them. And you have to measure that against interest rates, and you have to measure it against other bushes and other, um, you know, other equations. And that's all, that's all investing is. It's a value decision based on, you know, what it is worth, how many birds are in that bush, when you're going to get them, and what interest rates are. Now, if you pay $500 billion, and when, when we buy a stock, we always think in terms of buying the whole enterprise because it enables us to, to think as businessmen rather than as stock speculators. So let's just take a, a company that has marvelous prospects, is paying you nothing now, and you buy it at a valuation of $500 billion. Now, if you feel that 10% is the appropriate rate of return, uh, and you can pick your figure, that means that if it pays you nothing this year, but starts paying next year, it has to be able to pay you $55 billion in perpetuity each year. But if it's not going to pay until the third year, then it has to pay you $60.5 billion in perpetuity, in perpetuity, to justify the present price. Every year that you wait to take a bird out of the bush means that you have to take out more birds. It's that simple. And I, I question in my mind whether sometimes whether people who pay $500 billion implicitly for a business by buying 10 shares of stock at some price are really thinking of the mathematical, the mathematics implicit in what they are doing. To deliver, let's just assume it's, there's only going to be a one-year delay before a business starts paying out to you and you want to get a 10% return and you pay $500 billion. That means $55 billion of cash that they have to be able to disgorge to you year after year after year. To do that, they have to make perhaps $80 billion or close to it pre-tax. Now, you might look around at the universe of businesses in this world and see how many are earning $80 billion pre-tax, or 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or 30 and you won't find any. Uh, so, it requires uh, a rather extraordinary change in profitability to give you enough birds out of that particular bush to make it worthwhile to give up the one that you have in your hand. The uh, uh, second part of your question about whether we'd be willing to buy a wonderful business at four times earnings, I think I could get even Charlie interested in that. So. But let's hear it from Charlie. I'd like to know what that is. He was hoping you would ask that, the fellow that's got all his net worth in this stock <laughs> and who has a captive audience. Uh, tell us what it is. You've got to tell us. We're begging you. <laughs> you want the name of the company? We want the name of the company. We're okay. dying to get the name. Wait till I get my pencil out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's called National RV, and it's based in California, and they sell recreational vehicles. Okay. Well, you've got a, a crowd of people with... Who have birds in the hand, and we will see what they do in terms of national <laughs> RV. Charlie, do you have anything further on growth and value, et cetera? 
Watch him carefully, folks. <laughs> well, I agree that all intelligent investing is value investing. You, you have to acquire more than you really pay for, and that's a value judgment. But you can look for more than you're paying for in a lot of different ways. You can use filters to sift the investment universe. And uh, if you stick with stocks that can't possibly be wonderful to just put away in your safe deposit box for 40 years, but are underpriced, then you have to keep moving around all the time. As they get closer to what you think the real value is, you have to sell them and then find others. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an active kind of investing. The investing where you find a few great companies and just sit on your ass because you've correctly predicted the future. That is what it's very nice to be good at. The movie was G-rated even though. <laughs> is that it, Charlie? <laughs> think about long-term cash flows, do you try to forecast growth or do you just think about certainty? If you have an indestructible company like Coca-Cola or Burlington Northern, do you try to estimate growth? Well, we think, are, are you finished on that? Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, we, growth is part of the investment equation and obviously we love profitable growth. So if, if we would love to figure out a way to, uh, say, take a C's candy, to move it geographically uh, 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 into new areas, uh, all kinds of things. I mean, we're, if we could find areas for growth with C's, it would be likely to be very, very profitable. If Coca-Cola, which is in 200 countries, I mean, they have pursued that policy successfully now for 125 years. And some products travel way better than others. But when we look at a business, and we're looking out in the future, obviously if we see growth in that picture and it's growth where it, which is, produces a high return on incremental capital involved, we love it. But we do not rule out companies where we think there'll be little or no growth if the price is attractive uh, relative to the earning power. Uh, you know, there will be some growth over time in something like lubricants, you know, at, at Lubrizol, but it won't be dramatic growth. And would we love it if it, you know, if it were going to grow 10% a year in units or something of the sort? Sure, but it isn't, that's not going to happen. Uh, so it's a, it's a factor in every investment decision because we're really looking out to the future as to future earning power, but also future capital requirements. And we, we think plenty about whether any business we go into is likely to grow profitably. And sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong, but we don't rule out companies that have very slow growth uh, or, or no growth uh, possibilities. Charlie? Yeah, well, the interesting thing is that in our country, the business schools teach people to make these projections way in the future. And they program these computers to grind these projections out and then they use them in their business decision making, et cetera, et cetera. I've always regarded those projections as doing more harm than good. And Warren has never prepared one that I know of. And where an investment banker prepares one, we tend to throw them aside without reading them. We and turn them upside down, actually. What? <laughs> we turn them upside down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think an enormous false precision gets into things when you program computers to make forward projections for a long period of time. We make rough projections in our head all the time. Sure. And we don't do any of those formal projections because the fact that they're there in paper and came out of a computer makes some people think they must be significant. I really think they do more damage than they do good. When we bought Scott Fetzer, which was back in about 1985, it had been shopped by First Boston to more than 30 parties 
they never got around to calling us. So after shopping at the 30 parties, Scott Fetzer finally was working on a deal uh, with an ESOP after something else had fallen through. I forget the exact details. And I sent a letter to Ralph Shea. I'd read about it in the paper. I never met him, never talked to the guy. But I sent him a letter. I figured I'd gamble 21 cents or whatever the first class rate was then. And I said, we'll pay $60 a share if you like the idea. I'll meet you in Chicago Sunday. And if you don't like the idea, tear up the letter. So that took place, and Ralph met me. And we made the deal. And we paid the $60 a share or whatever it was. And Charlie and I went back to sign up the deal. And the fellow from First Boston was there. And he was a little abashed since he had not sent us, uh, contacted us at all when they were looking for something. But naturally, he had a contract that called for a few million dollars of commission, even though he not bothered to ever contact us. And we made the deal by ourselves. So in a, in a moment of, of exuberance, he, while he was collecting his few million dollars, he said to Charlie, he said, well, we prepared this book in connection with Scott Fetzer, and since you're paying us a couple million dollars and have gotten nothing so far, he said, he said, maybe you would like to have this book. And Charlie, with his usual tax, said, I'll pay you two million dollars if you don't show me the book. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and I should mention, uh, this will, in, in, connection, in connection with Lubrizol, Dave Sokol met James Hambrick, I think on, on whatever it was, January uh, 25th or whatever the date, and, and he, uh, uh, Lubrizol had already made projections publicly out to 2013, and Dave told me that they had, they, that James had also given him some projections, I guess, out to 2015 or something, and did I want to see him? And I told him no, you know, I mean, it, I don't, I don't want to look at the other fellow's projections. I've never seen a projection from an investment banker that didn't show the earnings going up over time. And believe me, the earnings don't always go up over time. So it just, you know, it's the old story. Don't ask the barber whether you need a haircut. You know, I mean, you, you do not want to ask an investment banker what he thinks the earnings are going to be in five years or something he's trying to sell. So I pay no attention to that, that sort of thing. But we do, as Charlie says, we are doing projections in our head, obviously when we look at a business. I mean, we, when we look at any company to buy or any stock to buy, we are thinking in our mind, we're, 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 we've got a model in our mind of what that place is likely to look at, like over some period of years. And then we also have some model in our mind of how far off we can be. I mean, there's some things we can be way off on, there's other things we, we're likely to be in a fair, fairly narrow range on. So all that is taking place. But we sure don't want to listen to anybody else's projections. For those of you who are about to enter business school or who are there, I recommend you learn to do it our way, but at least until you're out of school, you have to pretend to do it their way. Uh, Mr. Buffett, my question is on business valuation and growth. In one of your letters, you mentioned the discounting formula, owner earnings divided by the difference between the discount and the growth rate. Uh, but if the growth rate is larger than the discount rate, and if we use this formula, then we get a negative number. And one way around this, let's call method A, is to have two growth stages, one with a high growth and the second stage with a low growth. And the second way, method B, would be to estimate how much the earnings is, is on the third year for the company, and then multiply this by the average price to earning ratio to get the price in the 10th year. I don't know if you use the method A or method B, but if not, I would like to ask Mr. Buffett, how do you estimate how much a company is worth if the growth rate is larger than the discount rate? Well, you put your finger on an interesting a mathematical relationship, because if you're using a, a present value discount formula and you put in a growth rate that is higher than the discount rate as you have postulated, the answer, of course, will be infinity. And there are a lot of managements around who like to think their stocks are worth infinity, but we haven't found one yet. The, uh, that, 
that precise subject was covered in a paper uh, called the St. Petersburg Paradox by a fellow named Durant probably 30 years ago. Uh, uh, and somewhere we probably have a copy at our office. Uh, my, my guess is if you go to Google and you put in the name Durant and you put in St. Petersburg, you may be able to call up that article, although they aren't necessarily terrific on old, old articles. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like it, we would, um, if you'll let somebody know at our office, we'll, we'll look around a little and we, see if we can find that. Uh, that, that. Uh, it gets very dangerous to project out high growth rates because you get into this paradox. Uh, if you say the growth rate of a company is going to be 9% between now and Judgment Day, and you use a 7% discount rate, it, it, uh, it goes off, you know, you get into infinity. And uh, uh, that's where people get in a lot of trouble. The, the idea of projecting out extremely high growth rates for very long periods of time has caused investors to lose, you know, very, very large sums of money. There aren't many companies. Just take a look at the Fortune 500. Go back 50 years, it's, they're commemorating that. And look at the companies there, that were there and how many have, uh, how many have really maintained uh, rates much above 10%. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy hurdle. And when you get up to 15, you know, you're, you're in the atmosphere, a, way, a rarefied atmosphere. Uh, so that's the, there's a real danger in projecting out high growth rates. And, and Ch Charlie and I uh, will very seldom, well, virtually never get up into, into high digits. You can lose a lot of money doing that. You may miss an opportunity sometime, but I haven't seen people who have been consistently successful doing that. And you do run into this paradox you mentioned. Charlie? Well, you're obviously right when you get a mathematical result that is infinity to back off and realize that can't happen. And of course, what people do is they project that the growth rate will, will uh, reduce and indeed eventually stop. And then you get more realistic numbers. What else could anyone do? When you uh, are estimating a growth rate on a, uh, uh, a company I'm at, of a very predictable company, I imagine uh, you apply a big margin of safety to it. W what kind of rate do you generally apply? I mean, high single digits? In the margin of safety? or the... uh, what, what kind of growth rate would you, on a predictable company, might you We are willing to buy at? companies that aren't going to grow at all. But, uh, okay. It, it, assuming we get enough for our money when we when we do it, so it it we are not looking we are looking at, at projecting numbers out as to what kind of cash we think we'll get back over time. But uh, you know, would you rather have a savings if you're going to put a million dollars in a savings account? Would you rather have something that paid you 10 percent a year and never changed, or would you rather have something that paid you 2 percent a year and increased to 10 percent a year? Well, you can you, you can work out the math to answer those questions, but you can. You can certainly have a situation where there's absolutely no growth in a business, and it's a much better investment than some company that's going to grow at very substantial rates, particularly if they're going to need capital in order to grow. There's a huge difference in the business that grows and requires a lot of capital to do so and the business that grows and doesn't require capital. And I would say that generally financial analysts do not give adequate weight to the, to the difference in those. Uh, in fact, it's amazing how little attention is, is, is paid to that. But, uh, believe me, if you're investing, you should pay a lot of attention to it. Charlie? I, I agree with that, but it, it, it's fairly simple, but it's not so simple it can all be explained in one sentence. Our, some of our best businesses that we own outright don't grow, but they, they, they throw off lots of money which we can use to buy something else. And, Therefore, our capital is growing without physical growth being in the business. And we are much better off being in that kind of a situation than being in some business that itself is growing, but that takes up all the money in order to grow and doesn't produce that high returns as we go along. But, uh, a lot of managements don't understand that very well. Excellent. 